This is Naked Mormonism. I pledge my life, all that I may have. I will strive to the utmost of my ability to be what you would want me to be. It's time to find the truth. And having set our hand to the plow, we will never look back until this work is finished. Where is the church going? I have faith that the Constitution will be saved as prophesied by Joseph Smith. But it will not be saved in Washington. It will be saved by enlightened members of this church. The explicit tag is there for a reason. So if you get offended at what's said, it's not for you. But most importantly, may you ponder the truths you've heard. May they help you become even better than you were. Skepticize everything. Welcome to episode 28 of the Naked Mormonism podcast, the Serial History Podcast. Today is February 18th, and my name is Bryce Blankenegel. Thank you for joining me. Before getting started today, I just wanted to say um, congratulations to both Dave and Michael of the My Book of Mormon podcast and to the listeners of this show. Um, We we actually won three Brody Awards, which Brody Awards are kind of this uh, online ex-Mormon community where they nominate various ex-Mormon works that have come out throughout the year. There's a bunch of different categories, and uh, the show won... uh, the Brody Awards in three categories, and My Book of Mormon took one category of Brody Awards. So that's awesome. So to the listeners of both of our shows, thank you so, so very much. I'm absolutely stoked that uh, that this has happened. It's something I, I've been working towards since I learned about them last year. So thank you all very much for voting and for tuning in and for making that possible. Thanks. Also had one quick correction um, on last week's, well, I guess not last week's, but the previous week's historical episode. When I was talking about Brigham Young and uh, the reading the Aaron DeWitt letter, I said that it was the Donna Reed party that uh, got caught in 1856 that the letter was referring to. No, that was actually the Martin Willie Handcart Company. Donna Reed went across in 1846. They were not affiliated with Mormons or Mormonism at all. Um, the one that I was referring to was a Willie Martin Handcart Company. It also looks like I may have conflated some of the uh, details. Um, apparently, the Donna Reed party was known for... Um, the the acts of cannibalism because they were so desperate um but that uh, from the records that i could find it looks like cannibalism did not happen with the martin willie handcart company so i just conflated a couple of details and i just had to straighten that out real quick so let's uh let's get to this episode um but first a roundup of the last historical episode as a whole it it did mark kind of a big occurrence in mormon history At the time of this occurrence, it was probably nothing special, but in April of 1832, we had the introduction of Brigham Young into the church, and his brothers soon followed him. We spent half of the episode just reading amazing Brigham Young quotes, and quite frankly, he... he came across as like some kind of like crazed sociopathic pedophile and you know obviously he was kind of like joe with the maniacally narcissistic god complex but you know brigham went kind of full tilt with it though he didn't hold anything back whereas joe seemed to have a little bit of decorum with his crazy i mean i gotta be honest i've been waiting quite some time for this guy to enter into the timeline and now that he's here and, you know, Bloody Brigham is actually going to have an impact on our timeline. We can really get into some church politics and backbiting. Um, yeah, I mean, strap in, kids. This, this ride's going to get more and more loony every episode. So, of course, before we talked about Brigham Young and some of the quotes that he said uh, from the Journal of Discourses, we had to advance the timeline a little bit. We talked about Philo Dibble Dabble financing a couple of mission trips, as well as providing the money necessary to purchase a printing press in New York. The press was purchased by Father Newell K. Whitney and Algernon Sidney or Acid Gilbert. And 
they moved it to Independence, Missouri, where William Wines, or Double Dub Phelps, would oversee printing of a few different publications. One of these was the Evening and Morning Star, which was the church-distributed newspaper wherein current events and new revelations were provided. Another of these publications was the Mormon-only proprietary hymn book, for which Joe actually commissioned his wife Emma to select her favorite hymns to include into it. And then the final of these publications that was to be printed was the Book of Commandments, which was the accumulation of a large percentage of the revelations that Joe, Ollie, and Hidge Penrigged and had given up to this point. So Joe went on a personal mission to acquire the paper needed for all of these works to go into the print, and he ran into a little snag. Um, turns out the paper's really expensive, and he didn't really have much money for all of his wants and dreams that he was hoping to attain with the printing press. Initially, he planned to uh, print 10,000 copies of the Book of Commandments, uh, but that number was changed to 3,000, and the physical size of the book was shrunk down to pocket size in order to save on paper. So it was kind of, you know, desperate. But before that, of course, we met a very special person to Joe, who is named Mary Elizabeth Rollins. She was one of the first women that Joe met that would later become one of his wives. She entered into our timeline by receiving a book from a wealthy local landowner named Isaac Morley, whom we gave the nickname of Yelra Morley after the commune that he would found. Just a palindrome of his name. It's amazing. And after that, Mary converted to Mormonism. Um, she was working with Peter Whitmer, who was a tailor for the newly inaugurated Lieutenant Governor Lilbert Boggs, who tried to deconvert Mary, and then who also eventually signed the Mormon extermination order. So that Lilburn Boggs is kind of an interesting fellow as well. The one main thing, other than Brigham Young, that we focused on last episode was the United Order. So, finances have been one point of Mormon history that we can't seem to break away from. There always seems to be a problem with money or just, you know, simple lack thereof, and it required divine revelations to remedy the problems. Uh, but the problem is Joe had dipped so far into the gracious pockets of the new Mormons by taking their donations, but it simply wasn't sustainable. He had to set up the law of tithing requiring gifts of money from the parishioners. Requiring, that's the operative phrase. And then he established the United Order to hopefully organize and budget that money somehow. Now all of this would eventually fail and the Kirtland Satis Society would be established soon after. But for now the United Order was the financial glue that held Kirtland and the church as a whole together. Alright, that's, uh, that's enough of the roundup. Let's get into the meat of today's episode. So once the printing store was set up in Independence and Joe ordered the 3,000 copies of the Book of Commandments and the hymn book and the newspaper to be published, Joe Rigdon and Father Whitney made their way back to Kirtland. Joe would return to his wife, Emma, who was still living in the Johnson home in Hiram, Ohio. Rigdon would return to Kirtland, and Father Whitney would continue working at the Whitney store in Kirtland. And of course, if we remember um, his store, he was a business partner with Algernon Sidney or A. Sid Gilbert, and uh, Gilbert was running the uh, Whitney Gilbert store in Missouri while Father Whitney was operating the store in Kirtland which, of course, had been absorbed by the church and was kind of under the direction of Bishop Eddie Party Boy Partridge because it was called the Bishop Storehouse. I, I know it's crazy, the spider web of people and, and names and what they were doing. <laughs> it's, it's, all, uh, it's all part of it, though. During the return trip from Independence back to Kirtland, Father Whitney broke his leg in a wagon accident, which is, you know, kind of a bummer. You know, it's probably not important, but it's worth including. I mean, if nothing else, just for the humanity's sake of uh, Father Whitney's experience. So in the summer of 1832, publications started to come out of the printing press and reach the followers of Mormonism. They covered everything from revelations to politics to foreign affairs to calls to action by the church leadership and everything in between. And this is an excerpt from the Star's foreign news section. Quote, It is a day of strange appearances. Everything indicates something more than meets the eye. Every nation is opening events which astonish mankind. 
Even the heart of man begins to melt at the prospect before him. The unquenchable thirst for news, the continuity of immigration, the wars and rumor of wars, with many other signs of the distress of nations from the old world, as the land is called across the ocean. Whisper so loud to the understanding that he who runs may read the label on the eastern sky. The end is nigh, end quote. As you can tell, the star was just good for some real non-biased, you know, fact-based reporting that, you know, really got down to brass tacks and doesn't, you know, report anything ambiguously just for the sake of Christianizing it. No, of course not. It was very, very objective. Um, let's move on to another excerpt from that same publication. Now, I'm, I'm not sure if this was actually the first publication of the Evening and Morning Star, but it's the first one that appears in the history of the church after the printing press was established, so I assume it, it was either the first or one of the first publications of it. And this goes, quote, The Cholera! This desolating sickness is spreading steadily over the United States. The account of its ravages in many places we cannot give. The whole number of cases in New York to July 31st is 3,731. Deaths, 1,520. End quote. Oh, almost half. Holy crap. I, I'm, cholera is something that will become more and more pervasive throughout the history of the church. I, I mean, this cholera epidemic was really getting started in the 1830s, but by the 1840s in Nauvoo, a large percentage of the Mormons were infected, and it was taking a very heavy toll on the church and its people, and killing a lot of people, too. Uh, the next few lines from that same excerpt are really telling when trying to understand the mindset and perspective of an early 19th century outbreak and, you know, trying to explain it away. Quote, this is from that same publication. No man can stop the work of the Lord, for God rules the pestilence, and the pestilence rules men. Forts, sentinels, and oceans may hinder men, or money may bribe, but when the pestilence rides on the wings of the wind, the sentinel has no power. The fort is no obstacle, the ocean is no barrier, and the money has no value. The destroying angel goes waving the banner of death over all, and who shall escape his pointed arrow? Not he that could brave the death at the cannon's mouth, but shrinks at the sound of the cholera. Not he that worshipped his god in some stately chapel every Sabbath till the cholera comes and then flees for his life. No, none but he that trusts in God shall be able to stand when a thousand shall fall at his side and ten thousand at his right hand by the noisome pestilence, end quote. You know, I, I gotta admit... I like to see passages like this. I, I mean, I really like to use like historical empathy when it comes to studying history. If I can try and jump into these people's shoes, it really helps to insert the human element and understand it from their perspective. It helps us to understand not only the situations and the occurrences, but the people that experienced said situations and occurrences. So put yourself there and imagine watching friends and members of your family contracting cholera with no reasonable explanation and then statistically speaking from that other newspaper article, watching half of them die off from it. I mean, that's just insane. I mean, this was long before the Soho London cholera outbreak of 1854, where the scientist named uh, John Snow really kicked off like the science of epidemiology or popularized it. I mean, this was a time when babies were dying constantly because doctors wouldn't wash their hands when they went from performing autopsies to delivering babies. This was a time when the vast majority of people had no idea what germs or bacteria were, nor did they understand how any of it was transmitted. Now, what else would they use to explain it other than God controlling pestilence and selecting who lives and dies according to their righteousness? It's always worth keeping in mind, this is the world and mindset that the Book of Mormon was born out of. These are the people that we're dealing with. On September 22nd, 1832, a very odd trip happens, and I, I'm still trying to wrap my mind around it. I can find almost nothing in the books about this trip, which is quite odd. Usually when Joe goes somewhere, he either had somebody to follow him and write down what he was doing, or he just recounted it himself, what he was doing, his arrival and departure dates, and uh, the, the main focus of the trip. 
In the case of his trip out to Independence, we can track when he left, uh, what his main objective was when he arrived, and then also when he returned. For the trip that we're about to discuss, this is the only thing that is recorded and is taken from the history of the church. Quote, I continued the translation of the Bible and ministering to the church through the fall, accepting a hurried journey to Albany, New York, and Boston in company with Bishop Whitney, from which I returned on the 6th of November, immediately after the birth of my son, Joseph Smith III, end quote. And that's it. With all of his other trips that you know lasted almost a month and a half, there is usually a stated purpose and some details that we discussed, you know, about, about the arrival and departure dates. But all we have from the entire month of October 1832 is one love letter that Joe wrote to Emma. I mean, the purpose of this trip and what happened are completely absent from the record. Now, and let me be clear here, this happens occasionally throughout Joe's timeline, so it's not extremely out of the ordinary. The main point I'm focusing on is how little of a mention it receives in the history of the church and why it was, quote, hurried. With a bit of cursory searching, I, I was hard-pressed to find anything on this trip from my usual sources. Even branching out to some other publications by BYU, this trip is largely ignored, even though it was kind of peculiar and came at a very, very busy time in Joe's life. I mean, almost anything that I find online about it just links back to this passage in the history of the church that we just read. Now, I gotta admit, I really don't like it when I venture into waters where there isn't much writing on the subject, because then I open myself up to being completely and absurdly wrong, and I don't have a source to fall back on as a safety net. Oh well, here goes. Follow me through this hypothetical. Uh, just, just work with me for a minute here. In writing a couple of chapters of the forthcoming book, I've been studying a lot about the Spalding authorship theory. If you're listening to this and don't know what I'm referring to, go back and listen to some older episodes because it's a massive body of evidence that takes too long to try and cover here. In order to try and explain this journey, I'm going to assume, just for argument's sake that the Spalding authorship theory is true and Rigdon was responsible for a large portion of the Book of Mormon. Now, I, 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 I gotta qualify, given the available evidence, it's not even a little bit hard to think that this is the case and grant truth to that evidence, even if it's just for argument's sake. But that's all we're doing right now, just posing a hypothetical just for argument's sake. So before this trip happened uh, that kicked off in September of 1832, we had mid-February of 1832 with Orson Hyde and Samuel Smith. They went preaching the Book of Mormon in Conneaut, Ohio. And, you know, this was actually only a few months after the first newspaper article had linked Rigdon as being the author of the Book of Mormon. So when the missionaries preached from the book, the people that were living in Conneaut claimed that it was written by an older man named Solomon Spaulding, uh, who was dead at the time. If Rigdon had taken Spaulding's manuscript found, Rigdon would have known about this chink in the armor of the Book of Mormon, and he would know that Spaulding's widow and daughter would be the one place where the Book of Mormon could be demonstrably proven wrong. That is, if somebody were to ask them for some of Spaulding's writings— if somebody could prove that there was a manuscript that existed that the Book of Mormon was based off of, the whole Mormon religion would crumble. So, Matilda Davison, who was Spaulding's widow, may have had a copy of manuscript found, and there is evidence to suggest that her old butt may have obtained a copy of it, along with manuscript story, Conneaut Creek. Uh, we'll, we'll cover that in detail uh, next episode. We know that the shit hit the fan when the, the theory was widely popularized in E. D. Howe's book, Mormonism Unveiled, but Rigdon would have known it to be a loose end that would destroy the church's credibility. At this time, Jerome Clark had most of Spaulding's old writings, and he was in Hartwick, New York, but Matilda Davidson, who was Spaulding's widow, was living with her daughter, Matilda McKinstry, in Boston. If there were an older copy of manuscript found in existence, the only reasonable place to assume it would be is in the possession of Spaulding's widow. Joe and Father Whitney made a, quote, hurried journey to Boston and Albany, a round trip of well over 1,200 miles, a couple weeks journey each direction. It's hard to believe that this was just a spur-of-the-moment thing, but consider the timeline. This was a mere six months after Orson Hyde and Samuel Smith returned from their mission in Conneaut. 
And that six to seven month period was specifically a busy one for Joe. So if he had to make this more than a month long journey out to Boston, he had to plan things out. Also consider that in the history of the church, it just said that Joe returned right after his son Joseph Smith III was born. I mean, think about that. Why would an expecting father take off for that long right before his baby was born, only a month and a half after he just returned from a two-month-long trip to Zion to set up the printing press? I mean, this trip is just out of the ordinary, and it seems like it was haphazardly thrown together almost. Joe was so busy with so many things that were happening, I mean, not to mention an eighth-month pregnant wife. I mean, how could something take more precedence over his own child's birth and yet only receive an ambiguous sentence or two in the history of the church? So in October and November of the following year, 1833, Hurlbut would be making the same exact journey to try and ascertain manuscript found. So now that I've set up the timeline, I would argue that if the existence of manuscript found held an existential threat to the church, I can understand how it would be pressing enough to leave Joe's eight-month-old pregnant wife behind, knowing he might not return in time to be there for the birth of Joseph Smith III. Now, that maybe, just maybe, and, and you know, this is where I start to travel into really unknown waters, but maybe Joe and Father Whitney made the trip to Boston to try and get the original manuscript of Manuscript Found. Now, I mean, uh, th- this is just, I'm posing this hypothetical for argument's sake. Just think about it here. The printer's manuscript is what is theorized as being taken from the printing press by Rigdon for the Spalding theory to work. But obviously, Solomon Spalding didn't just start writing the printer's manuscript that was at the Patterson printing press. I mean, just like Joe and almost all authors, Spalding probably had a rough draft or original manuscript of manuscript found and had left the printer's manuscript at the Patterson printing press. The problem of leaving a printer's manuscript at a printer like um, Solomon did is the possibility of having somebody come along and steal or plagiarize the work, as was pervasive in those times, you know, kind of as it is now. I mean, even Joe himself was the victim of this when a guy named Abner Cole read the first part of the printer's manuscript of the Book of Mormon and printed it along with his own satirical version called the Book of Pukii. <laughs> in which he called Joseph Smith Joe the Ignoramus. Now, I mean, people had their work stolen from printing presses all the time, and Spalding was possibly victim of the same problem. Only, it was after his death, so he couldn't care, and it was by a guy Rigdon who was living far away from Spalding's widow, so nobody was there to, uh, to claim it or accuse Rigdon of doing such a thing. So this is how I see it, and this is where I really start to creep out onto the skinny part of the branch without a safety net to fall into. I believe that Spaulding had a rough draft called a manuscript story Conneaut Creek. He also had an original manuscript of Manuscript Found, and was in the process of putting the last touches on the printer's manuscript of it before publishing, that is, until he became ill and died in 1816. After that, in February of 1832, Orson Hyde and Samuel Smith were preaching in Conneaut, where Spaulding was living while working on his stories, and heard the complaints of the people that claimed the Book of Mormon was taken from Spaulding's work. They returned from their mission and informed Joe of the concerns raised in Conneaut, and Joe told Rigdon that the shitstorm was a bruin. Rigdon wanted to contain the problem, sent Joe on an emergency trip to find that original manuscript and save the church from plagiarism charges that would obliterate Rigdon and Joe's Mormonite commune. Father Whitney, having enough coin to get them to Boston and back with minimal amounts of walking every day and camping on the side of the road, was sent to accompany Joe and possibly maybe provide a decoy or something. I'm not sure how how he fits in exactly. Now, upon arriving to Boston, where Spaulding's widow and daughter live, Joe and Father Whitney knock on their door and say they're old friends of Solomon or something, and then, of course, they're invited in for coffee to discuss old times about Spaulding, and during the visit, they acquire the knowledge that the trunk with Spaulding's writings is in Hartwick, New York, with Jerome Clark. 
The men thank Matilda Davison and Matilda McKinstry for their hospitality and immediately head for Hartwick, a small town that's not far from Albany, and a straight shot between Albany and Kirtland, Ohio. So they go to the home of Jerome Clark and try to get a hold of the manuscript, and for whatever reason, they're unable to do so. Maybe Clark wasn't home, maybe Father Whitney wasn't enough of a distraction for Joe to be able to break away and look through the chest and find it, or maybe they didn't even find Jerome Clark, who knows? I mean, I, you know, Joe kind of had a bad habit for things not working out in his favor, and this situation was probably no different. No. On the flip side, let's say that um, Father Whitney and Joe were able to get into Jerome Clark's house and have a discussion or something. On the flip side, maybe Joe was able to break away from the conversation for long enough to rummage through the chest and grab the original manuscript of Manuscript Found and slip it under his frock coat and burn it later. Regardless, when Hurlbut came looking over a year later for Manuscript Found, there wouldn't be a copy of it for him to take, so he just grabbed what was there, Manuscript Story, Conneaut Creek, and then he split. Or, if Joe didn't get a hold of it, maybe Hurlbut did have a copy, which is a whole other rabbit hole, and we'll dive down into that when we get to the lawsuit that Joe filed against Hurlbut for threatening to murder and destroy Mormonism, and, you know, that's all stuff that we're going to cover next episode. So, that, I mean, that's kind of the hypothetical here, and that's, you know, like I said, it's a hypothetical. I, I mean, according to this nutty crazy theory here that I'm positing. Joe was most likely unsuccessful and chose to record the trip as a mere blip on the radar of Mormon history. And, you know, it, it was only two lines in there, and he just said it was a hurried trip. He would return to tell Rigdon that he'd failed in his mission to get a hold of Spalding's works, and they would cross their fingers in hopes that this would be the last of it. Now, I mean, like I said, I crept way out onto that limb without any scholarship that I could find to be a safety net. But it makes sense in my mind. I, I mean, it, it's a crazy theory, and it's an application of the Spalding theory to available evidence. Um, but it it does serve to explain why Joe went on this urgent trip to places that Hurlbut went to in order to find the exact manuscript that Hurlbut would try to find in late 1833. It explains why Joe didn't record any specifics about the trip, and why he didn't provide any revelations during it, or visit any believers, or give any sermons while out in the area. I mean, Joe had never been to Boston before, and I, I mean, I have to ask, what was in it for him to travel there now, during this busy time in his life? I mean, with an eight-month pregnant wife at home, it's just mind-boggling and so peculiar. Now, I have to admit, it could also be said that Joe and Father Whitney needed supplies, or they needed to visit some other people in that area, or something to that effect, and those are both understandable explanations, so I'm just positing this single motive for the trip beyond that. Maybe there's something to it. The point of the conspiracy that I'm pointing at serves to explain a fair amount of evidence. And, you know, if you think about it, it's perfectly within the scope of reality. If the Spalding authorship theory is true, it's understandable that Joe and Radian will go to extreme lengths to silence such damning accusations or to cover their own tracks in the case of burning the, the uh, original manuscript to manuscript found if they were able to acquire it. Now, in thinking about it, had somebody come along and talked with Matilda Davison and Matilda Kinstry about their husband and father, that might be something that they would mention in their meeting with Hurlbut. And if that did happen, I, I mean, if Joe and Father Whitney did visit the wife and widow of Spaulding, it's something that I think they would remember, and you can be damn sure that they would tell Hurlbut and they, that Hurlbut would have reported it. You know, if Joe were there a year before he was to cover up his own messy tracks, Hurlbut would have been happy to blow that apart. But that's only if Matilda Davison and Matilda McKinstry had said anything about it. So, you know, who knows? Maybe maybe it was a visit that they didn't... I mean, maybe it was a very typical visit and of just a couple of traveling salesmen that they saw um, that they didn't take any special notice of or what. I, I don't know. I mean, like I said, there's no scholarly backing for anything that I just talked about or for the claim that Joe investigated the whereabouts of manuscript found 10 months before Hurlbut did. I mean, there is an understandable excuse that he was buying supplies or something, but that doesn't explain why it was hurried and seemingly hasty in the, the nature of the trip. 
it's just my own little theory about this trip. It's my own, and I'm positing it. I couldn't find anything about it anywhere else. And I have to be honest, I look forward to retracting this this claim once somebody emails in and calls me like a wacko conspiracy theorist or something and provides a different explanation. So let's let's put that little uh, you know theory aside and get back to actual reality here. And instead of trying to posit these you know crazy not necessarily based on evidence theories about what Joe was doing in his free time. So once Joe arrived back in Kirtland after his, his, you know, this trip we talked about to Boston and Albany or, you know, Hartwick, if you buy what I just claimed, Joseph Smith III had already been born. This was the first of Joe's children that would survive longer than a few hours and live long after Joe's gunfight death. Joe's timeline has been a mess up to this point, and I'm not just talking for us to try and recount today, but even back then, much like today, most people that were members of Joe's church knew very little about him and the origin of the Book of Mormon. They had heard that an angel appeared to Joe and Ollie and gave them the priesthood, and they'd heard how he'd valiantly rescued the plates from the ground and translated them with the help of Ollie and others. They had probably even heard the story about Not So Smarty Marty losing 116 pages, but they probably didn't know about the first vision story. The reason I bring this up is to talk about Joe's first first vision scenario. This was recorded in the handwriting of Joseph Smith personally, um, as well as Freddie G. Willie. The testimony actually alternates between their handwritings, you know, Freddie's and Joseph's. Um, for whatever reason, I'm not sure. It kind of seems strange to me, but I'm sure there is some legitimate reason for it. This was also recorded at a time when Hinchpin Rigdon had been essentially kicked out of the church for, yes, you guessed it, calling Joe a false prophet. Once again, I mean, this was the second time this happened. At the Sunday meeting on July 8th, 1832, Joe demanded that Rigdon surrender his priesthood license because Rigdon had once again claimed that the keys of the kingdom were lost and that he alone, that Rigdon alone, had retained the keys, trying to strip power from Joe. Rigdon pulled this same trick back in early 1832, remember that? Before the mob came and tried to castrate Joe and beat Rigdon senseless when they tarred and fed their both of them? I mean, during this first insurrection in earlier 1832, Rigdon had claimed that the keys were taken from the earth, just like he did in July, and I posited the claim that Joe beat the living fuck out of him for trying to scare the parishioners away from Joe. The history recounted it as an unseen force tossed him around the room. You know, I'm paraphrasing, of course. But I think the force was seen by Rigdon when it was happening, and that force was probably just Joe being a loose cannon like he always was. Well, th this led to another insurrection a mere six months later, wherein Rigdon told everybody that Joe had lost the keys to the kingdom, yet Rigdon had retained them. We've seen this happen a couple of times to Joe, and this wouldn't be the last time by far. Apparently, three weeks after this little tissy fit, Rigdon was reinstated into the church presidency without the horrible beating as a rite of passage like had been the case with the first insurrection earlier that year. And this explains why Joe would record his own personal history at this time. Joe was facing another obstacle that could turn the parishioners of the church against him. So he came up with this little divine conversion story, which is kind of a typical, you know, like, born-again Christian story, and no, it isn't much more than that. And he did it to set him apart from Rigdon and hope that everybody would continue to follow him instead of Rigdon. This was also just before the whole thing was set to unravel with the problems giving wind to the Spalding rumors in Conneaut. I mean, things were quickly unraveling for Joe, no matter what, so he recorded his history once and for all, for all to examine, question, and validate the truth of Joe's claims of being a prophet. And he recounted this in July of 1832. So this is the entirety, well, not the whole thing, but this is the majority of Joe's first vision, um, but it's the first version of the first vision. And it's taken from the church-run josephsmithpapers.org. So, just to keep this clear, this was a time when Rigdon was um, preaching to people that Joe wasn't a real prophet. So, Joe made this up as his um, authority claim that superseded Rigdon's authority. Quote, 
I was born in the town of Sharon in the state of Vermont, North America, on the 23rd day of December, A.D. 1805, of goodly parents, like Nephi, who spared no pains in instructing me in the Christian religion. At the age of about 10 years, my father, Joseph Smith Sr., moved to Palmyra, Ontario County, in the state of New York, and being in indigent circumstances, were obliged to labor hard for the support of a large family, having nine children. And as it required their exertions of all that were able to render any assistance for the support of the family, therefore we were deprived of the benefit of an education. Suffice it to say, I was merely instructed in reading and writing and the ground rules of arithmetic, which constituted my whole literary acquirements. At about the age of twelve years, my mind became seriously impressed with regard to all the important concerns for the welfare of my immortal soul, which led to me searching the scriptures, believing as I was taught that they contained the word of God, thus applying myself to them, and my intimate acquaintance with those of different denominations led me to marvel exceedingly, for I discovered that instead of adorning their profession by a holy walk and godly conversation, agreeable to what I found contained in the sacred depository, this was a grief to my soul. Thus, from the age of twelve years to fifteen, I pondered many things in my heart concerning the situation of the world of mankind, the contentions and divisions, and the wickedness and abominations, and the darkness which pervaded the minds of mankind. So, just to clarify real quick here, all of that so far is very similar to what people understand as the current day uh, recounting, uh, with the exception of the age there. He said in this account that he, from the age of 12 to 15, he pondered many things in his heart. However, it's taught that in 1820, when he was 14 years old, he uh, he went out to the sacred grove, and that's when God the Father and Jesus Christ personally, you know, his two separate corporeal beings descended over his head and told him that, you know, all the churches are false and all of their professors are corrupt and so on and so forth and you know that supposedly happened in 1820 when he was 14 but here it's saying that from the age of 12 years to 15 he pondered many things in his heart um concerning you know religion and just the world in general so you know that's the only difference that we've seen so far between the first vision account that's recounted here in 1832 that we're reading as opposed to the one that was uh, recounted in 1838 and uh, published in 1842 that the church teaches from now uh, he goes on to say let's see I'm going to try and read some of this in Joe speak. My mind become exceedingly distressed, for I become convicted of my sins, and by searching the scriptures I found that man did not come unto the Lord, but that they had apostatized from the true and living faith, and there was no society or denomination that built upon the gospel of Jesus Christ as recorded in the New Testament, and I felt to mourn for my own sins and for the sins of the world. For I learned in the scriptures that God was the same yesterday, today, and forever, that he was no respecter of persons, for he was God. For I looked upon the sun, the glorious luminary of the earth, and also the moon rolling in their majesty through the heavens, and also the stars shining in their courses, and the earth upon which I stood, and the beast of the field, and the fowls of heaven, and the fish of the waters, and also man walking forth upon the face of the earth in majesty, and in the strength of beauty, whose power and intelligence in governing the things which are so exceeding great and marvelous, even in the likeness of him who created them. And when I considered upon these things, my heart exclaimed, Well, hath the wise man said, The fool saith in his heart there is no God. My heart exclaimed, All these bear testimony and bespeak an omnipotent and omnipresent power, a being who maketh laws and decreeth and bindeth all things in their bounds, who filleth eternity, who was and is and will be from all eternity to eternity. And when I consider these things, and that being seeketh such to worship him as worship him in spirit and in truth, therefore I cried unto the Lord for mercy, for there was none else whom I could go and obtain mercy. All right. 
so far, most of that is quite similar to the uh, the recounting uh, that's that's currently taught in the church. Only it's a lot more profound. That's something that I I find fascinating about this is the 1838 version is n- nowhere near this profound. How Joseph was on this uh, you know this spirit quest, how he was looking at the sun, the moon, and the stars, and seeing the beauty of the fowls and the trees and the birds, and it, you know how amazing the world is. It, it doesn't really talk much about that in the, the 1838 version uh, because it seems like with this in this version here, Joseph was really honestly praying to God to see what, you know, what God's will was or what the true church was. And it was because he was, you know, witnessing all of these things that he couldn't explain that were so beautiful. Um, you know, a reason why a lot of people, uh, feel like they're born again or they, they, they come have like a coming to Jesus thing when they look at how beautiful the world is or when they see their child's face for the first time when they're born or whatever reason it could be. It's, it's just really fascinating to see it recounted this way that he was having this, you know, this spiritual conundrum and fighting him, his self and his own uh, sins and whatnot. And he was honestly petitioning God for help. Um, you know, I don't doubt that it actually happened this way um, up to the point that we're about to read. Anyway, I don't doubt that he had this, this, uh, questioning time because a lot of people go through the same exact thing about the same age. Um, but you know, this is where it starts to differ. And this is where a lot of the, uh, differences between the 1832 and the 1838 account come in. Um, and that's when it starts talking about what happened after he prayed to God. Um, he goes on himself saying, the Lord heard my cry in the wilderness. And while in attitude of calling upon the Lord, And then it's inserted in the 16th year of my age in different handwriting. A pillar of fire, light above the brightness of the sun at noonday, come down from above and rested upon me. And I was filled with the Spirit of God. And the Lord opened the heavens upon me. And I saw the Lord, and he spake unto me, saying, Joseph, thy sins are forgiven thee. Go thy walk in my statutes. And keep my commandments. Behold, I am the Lord of glory. I was crucified for the world, that all those who believe on my name may have eternal life. The world lieth in sin, and at this time, and none doeth good, no, not one. They have turned aside from the gospel and kept not commandments. They draw near to me with their lips while their hearts are far from me and mine anger is kindled against the inhabitants of the earth to visit them according to their ungodliness and bring to pass that which been spoken by the mouth of the prophets and apostles. Okay, so this is this is where the differences come in. Um, in the 1838 account, you know, that's taught today in the church, Joe was out praying in the sacred grove, and he uh, was enraptured, basically, and he saw a pillar of light wherein uh, God and Jesus separately descended down, like, floating over his head. And that's how it's depicted in all of... Like all of the church publications and all the pictures and the paintings and stuff that people have done, Joseph is alone out in the the garden or the the sacred grove, and he sees you know this bright light that blinds him, and then you know floating down, literally floating down from the sky, are God and Jesus separately. That's that's fairly different um, compared to what we read just now because he said here. Oh, and also that's in the 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 fourteenth year of his age. This says in the sixteenth year of his, of his age. So you know it's kind of hard to to understand how there's a two year difference there. Um, you know, eighteen twenty to eighteen twenty two. Uh, but in this, uh, this what happened with this account, a pillar of fire um, that was really bright came down and rested upon him, and he was filled with the Spirit of God. And then the heavens opened upon him. So I don't know what that means or if he just like had a vision or what the hell that means. But apparently at that point, he saw the Lord, and the Lord said, Thy sins are forgiven thee. It doesn't talk about the other churches being corrupt. It doesn't talk about start your own church. It doesn't talk about the angel Moroni would be, you know, would give you the plates. It doesn't talk about any of that 
information. It doesn't talk about that at all. And what's more is it says, I am the Lord of glory. I was crucified for the world. So it's, uh, you know, it's a Trinitarian belief of God. It's a single, uh, you know, monotheistic God. Uh, whereas with the current teachings of the church, it sees God and Jesus and the Holy Ghost as separate beings, um, all part of the Godhead, which is, you know, like a, you know, a, some kind of bastardized polytheism, but it's somehow still justified as monotheism, even though there's, there's an infinite regress of gods that's tied into there somehow as well. So, the current version is much more unique to Mormonism and nuanced, whereas this version that we're reading right here was so much more uh, uh, mainstream Christian, like mainstream Trinitarian Christian. So it's just worth pointing out the differences there. Um, it's weird that, you know, in the later account, it became more detailed by saying, oh, I was 14 and it happened on this day when I was 14 and it happened 1820. And then I saw God and Jesus separately. And then uh, God said, this is my beloved son, hear him. And then Jesus said, blah, blah, blah. You know, and none of those details are present. Those are all details that were added in later. So I, I just, you just have to point those out because those are a very big problem. Those are clearly a problem. Um, let me continue here. Behold and lo, I come quickly as it is written of me in the cloud, in the glory of my father. And my soul was filled with love. And for many days I could rejoice with the great joy. And the Lord was with me, but could find none that would believe the heavenly vision. Nevertheless, I pondered these things in my heart. And then here, for some reason, it switches to the authorship of Freddie Willie, uh, Frederick Williams, I should say. Um, so I'm not sure why the, the, this account is written in two different handwritings, but this switches to the handwriting of Freddie Willie. I fell into transgressions and sinned in many things which brought a wound upon my soul. And there were many things which transpired that cannot be written. And my father's family have suffered many persecutions and afflicted. And it came to pass when I was 17 years of age. Yes, it came to pass it's in there. I'm not kidding you. I called again upon the Lord and he shewed me a heavenly vision. For behold, an angel of the Lord came and stood before me. And it was by night, and he called me by name, and he said, The Lord had forgiven me my sins. And he revealed unto me that in the town of Manchester, Ontario County, New York, there was plates of gold upon which there was engravings, which was engravings by Moroni and his fathers and the servants of the living God in ancient days, and deposited by the commandments of God and kept by the power thereof, and that I should go and get them, and he revealed unto me many things concerning the inhabitants of the earth, which sins have been revealed in commandments and revelations. So I, I have to point this out here. Um, and, and this is important for, uh, for just one specific reason. When it says the, they were engraven by Moroni and his fathers, the servants of the living God in ancient days, this was two years after the Book of Mormon had been published. Um, and this was, you know, three years before the Book of Mormon was finished being dictated. No, almost to the day. Uh, and Moroni here is spelled M-A-R-O-N-I instead of M-O-R-O-N-I. It's interesting, Moroni versus Moroni. The reason I point that out is because it's it's posited that the angel Moroni was uh, possibly not the the same Moroni as was uh, like Moroni's promise Moroni. It's posited that the 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 name Moroni spelled with an A is actually taken from Spalding's manuscript because when other people recounted the name Moroni being included in the Spalding manuscript. It was always spelled with an A. It was never spelled Moroni. It was Moroni. And that's how it's spelled in Joseph's account right here, written by Frederick Williams. But this was, I mean, long after the Book of Mormon had been published. I mean, and did Joseph just forget how to spell the, like, second most important prophet in the Book of Mormon? 
I, I mean, I find that so fascinating that it's spelled a Moroni in this one, and that's that's like the Spalding spelling of Moroni, when Moroni had been in the Book of Mormon long before this. So I, that was just worth pointing out that that is a connection that some people posit as being something yeah, having to do with the uh, Spalding theory. Let's see, it continues here. And it was on the 22nd day of September, 1822, and thus he appeared unto me three times in one night, and once on the next day, and then I immediately went to the place and found where the place was deposited as the angel of the Lord had commanded me. Okay, okay, that's another detail that I need to point out right here. So, Joel was talking about when he was 16, he went out and prayed in the grove, uh, the sacred grove, and then, uh, the, you know, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw God, and God told him that his sins were forgiven and go his walk. And then very, very soon after that, you know, a couple days or a couple weeks or whatever, it says on the second or 22nd day of September, 1822, uh, the angel Moroni appeared to him. Yeah, I mean, I just, I find it fascinating that it says here on the 22nd day of September, 1822, that the angel Moroni had appeared to him, uh, three times in one night to tell him about the plates. Um, whereas in the current version, it's accounted in 1823. And then also it says here that he was 16 when the angel appeared to, or when the, the heavens were open to him and he saw the vision of God. Um, whereas in the current one, it's 1820. So when he was 14, so I, it's really hard to parse all of this out and <laughs> figure out exactly what Joe means by all of this. Um, because <laughs> it's, it's, it, the differences between the two versions from 1832 to 1838 are just, um, you know, problems. They're actually problems. They're details. Um, largely the story is kind of the same a little bit, but the, uh, the details keep getting, uh, bigger and better and more interesting and more exact. And, uh, it gets more epic every time. Um, all right, let's finish this thing up here. Uh, and he said, and straight away made three attempts to get them, meaning the plates, and then being exceedingly frightened, I supposed it had been a dream of vision. But when I considered, I knew that it was not. Therefore, I cried unto the Lord in agony of my soul. Why can I not obtain them? Behold, the angel appeared unto me again and said unto me, You have not kept the commandments of the Lord, which I gave unto you. Therefore, you cannot now obtain them. For the time is not yet fulfilled. Therefore, thou wast left unto temptation that thou mightest be made acquainted of with the power of the adversary. Therefore, repent and call on the Lord. Thou shalt be forgiven, and in his own due time thou shalt obtain them. End quote. Okay, so the last difference to point out there was uh, the the story of trying to, to get the plates. So here it says that he straightaway made three attempts to get them, and then he was exceedingly frightened. Um, in another, you know, Martin Harris recounted it as he uh, tried to pull out the plates, but then there was a toad that was guarding them that assumed the the... <laughs> visage of a man and struck Joe and, you know, uh, threw him three or four rods. And then, <laughs> I know you can't make this shit up. And then in the 1838 version, it's like he went to the, the thing and he pulled him out and he set him on the ground and he went and looked back in the box to see if he could find him. And then when he, uh, when, or if, to see if he could find anything else in the box. And then when he turned around to look at where he'd set the plates down, they were gone. And then he looked in the box and the plates were there. And then that's when he tried to get them out. And then hey, it's just, it's just absolute insanity. The differences that are not included in this, uh, you know, this earliest account of the first vision, this 1832 account. It's just really fascinating to find the, these blatant discrepancies between the two of them. Now, there are, you know, all of these were, you know, small differences, but they were significant, though. That's what the thing is, they are significant in uh, the implication of them being changed. Why would they be changed? I mean, if you look at uh, this 
in parallel to the First Vision account that's dictated in 1838. Um, that one's included in the history of the church and everything, and in the Book of Mormon. It's really easy to see where their narrative has been changed or been slightly modified in some ways. I mean, it leads me to a couple of questions. Why change the details in the first place? I mean, why omit the details that other people had recounted prior to this? I mean, why why omit the Total Man Spirit Guardian that changes from 1822 to 1823, the age that Joseph was, Jesus and God being separate corporeal beings, etc.? I mean, everything that we talked about. Why change what God said and did when he appeared to Joe? I mean, why Why did God and Jesus separately descend over Joe's head in 1820 in the latest accounts, but in this earliest account, the heavens merely opened up and Joe heard God say his sins are forgiven, and that was in 1822. Why, and I mean, this is the biggest part, why omit the part about the other churches being abominations and all their professors are corrupt? I mean, that's a big part of it as well. I mean, there are tons of differences here to parse out between the first account of 1832 versus the 38 version that's taught today that was actually published in 1842. And, you know, I kind of glossed over most of them, but the main question is just why, 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 why all the changes? I mean, in a court of law, it's seen as a big problem if a witness statement becomes more and more epic or more detailed with each telling. I mean, that implies embellishment or false remembering or, at worst, outright lying. And that's a big problem when it comes to the one true prophet of God and his own divinity claims. So, if if that wasn't good enough for you, which I hope it wasn't, for a much better deconstruction of the four different verse vision accounts, I would really highly recommend an insider's view of Mormon origins by Grant Palmer. In his chapter on the first vision, he puts the different versions side by side, four different versions, and he illustrates some of the striking differences in the stories. He shows a definite progression of the stories as they become more aggrandized and epic and detailed with each telling uh, progressively from 32 to 38. I mean, it's it's very, very fascinating to see all of the differences that Grant Palmer has found in them. Pay attention to what was happening in the storyline here, too. I mean, let's put all of this into context and see if we can find a recurring theme here. The recurring theme that I'm referring to here just centers around authority claims. The first authority claim that Joe made was the sole ability to baptize by him and Ollie Cowdung. Now, of course, when Ollie probably initiated the first insurrection in mid-1830, pulling the Whitmers and others away from the church, the story of the Aaronic priesthood was popularized, and Ollie was called the second counselor or the second elder of the church, while Joe claimed it to be the first elder. The next one we point to is Rigdon's insurrection in early 1832, when Joe possibly, and I think probably, beat the hell out of Rigdon. Once Rigdon tried to cut Joe off again in July of 1832, Joe knew that a beating would be suspicious if it happened a second time, so he invented the vision of divinity in 1822 and made the story of Moroni sound even better in this 1832 account we just read than he had ever sounded before. Now, extending beyond this, I don't know much about the context or the historical context of the 1835 and 36 and 34 accounts that Joe gave, but I know that his dictated history of the church in 1838 was due to the church nearly imploding due to the fall of the Kirtland Safety Society, or should I say Kirtland Safety Society Anti-Banking Company. (laughs) We'll get into that soon. When the people left the church in droves, when it collapsed, people everywhere, leadership, uh, normal followers, everybody, there was just, I mean, the church just bled these people. Of course, the 1838 version of Joe's history is what's detailed in the history of the church, volume one, and it's by far the most epic version out of all of them, in comparison to his earlier accounts anyway. Now, most historians understand that the 1838 Joseph Smith history is the least reliable and the most inflated of all of these histories that Joe gave. And for that reason, most historians argue about the veracity of the 1832 account that we just read and, you know, uh, argue about the details of it. Now, did you, did you kind of see the recurring theme throughout the recounted histories? I mean, they all seem to be the love child of a power struggle between Joe and somebody. 
I mean, think about it. In, in 1830, Joe was threatened by Ollie, who may have been trying to take over the church, so he claimed higher authority than Ollie had. In 1832, Reagan tried to cut off the anthropomorphic tumor Joe, and Joe reacted first with physical violence, secondly by inventing an authority claim that superseded Rigdon's authority. In 1838, the church had a truly existential threat and hemorrhaged people, and Joe came up with God and Jesus appearing to him separately in the sacred grove in 1820 at the age of 14. Of course, this was long before Rigdon was even a preacher, Ollie was even a thought on people's minds, and long before Joe was convicted for glass looking in 1826. So, This authority claim was the best thing that Joe could provide and latch onto without bending the truth too noticeably out of proportion. Maybe this is a ridiculous question at this point, but does that seem like something that fits the description of the one true prophet of God? Or does it sound a little more like a con man? I actually got an email that I was planning on talking about in the listener mail section of this episode, but it's pertinent right now. And this is from Anna. She says, Listening to the top of episode 27, it seems obvious that Joe was conning Rigdon's wife into thinking that he, meaning Rigdon, was out of his mind rather than being justifiably angry. Of course, this is talking about when uh, when Joe went and visited Rigdon after he was tarred and feathered and whatnot, and Rigdon asked his wife for a razor to kill Joe, and then, of course, Joe said that Rigdon asked him for a razor to kill his wife after that. Um, anyway, that's, that's what Anne is referring to here. She goes on, Rigdon knows that Joe's womanizing or girlizing, <laughs> that's, that's a little better because Miranda Johnson was only, you know, 16 at the time, anyway, uh, caused the mob attack that almost got him killed. He's furious and calls for his razor to kill Joe. He's probably not spelling out what Joe did, but his anger makes Mrs. Rigdon suspicious of Joe's behavior. But then after Mrs. Rigdon leaves the room, Joe pulls her aside and says, oh, he's out of his mind. He just wanted the razor to kill you. No doubt in my mind, Joe made that up on the spot. Con men got a con 24-7. Anyway, love the show. And that's that's the end of Anna's email. It, it just seems so pertinent. And that's what I wanted to convey when I was talking about that. But Anna did a much better job of it. Joe was a con man. And the instant that his cons didn't overlap or there was a chink in the armor, it posed a crisis to Joe's alter ego of the one true prophet. And that may have caused people to question him. In reaction to these multiple crises, Joe just made up bigger and better stories about how he was called of God and nobody could unseat him from his throne. No wonder he got fucking shot because people were so sick of his God complex and they couldn't deal with like this, this ravenous villain that was operating outside of the boundaries of anybody's rules. He was just doing whatever the fuck he want. I mean, nothing was sacred to Joe. He, he just looked out for number one. If there's one takeaway from this show, Joe was a master con artist and con men got a con 24-7. Given everything we've just talked about, is it really all that crazy to imagine that Joe had made the trip to Boston and Hartwick to find a manuscript found and effectively cover his own ass? I mean, I know that was a little while ago, but it it all ties in together and it's pertinent, and all of these stories are bright red flags and markers of a typical con man. But anyway, it's finally time in our historical narrative to sew up 1832 and move the timeline into 1833. Most of the important stuff that happened in 1832 had happened by this point, and, you know, the church had recorded that 538 members were active in the early December meeting, and it's only going to grow from there. Some very, very exciting things happened in 1832, but 1833 is sure to promise much more excitement. 1833 is the year in which the Book of Commandments is produced in very limited number before the independent printing press was destroyed. It's the year Dr. Falassus Hurlbut joins a church and is excommunicated twice. The United Order dissolves, multiple apostasies and breakout factions start, money problems begin to become a real threat, people talk in tongues, Dick Zybin Peterson leaves the church, or rather the church leaves him when it's driven out of Missouri. The Spalding theory really starts to ramp up and pull a lot of people away from the church, and Hurlbut threatens Joe's life and is arrested for it. <laughs> I mean, 
Uh, yeah, that's <laughs> that's just a snapshot. Let's see how far into these shenanigans we can get before this episode just becomes too long and big to deal with and we have to shut it down for the night. First thing to focus on is what's recorded for January 23rd of 1833 in the history of the church. Quote, about the 8th of November, I received a visit from elders Joseph Young, Brigham Young, and Heber C. Kimball of Menden, Monroe County, New York. They spent four or five days at Kirtland, during which we had many interesting moments. At one of our interviews, Brother Brigham Young and John P. Green spoke in tongues, which was the first time I had heard this gift among the brethren. Others also spoke, and I received the gift myself. And then it says, On the 23rd of January, we again assembled in conference, when after much speaking, signing, and praying, and praising God, all in tongues, we proceeded to the washing of feet, as commanded of the Lord. Each elder washed his own feet, after which I girded myself with a towel, and washed the feet of all of them, wiping them with the towel with which I was girded. End quote. Okay, I mean, okay. so... What happened here is um, Brother Brigham Young and John P. Green were speaking in tongues. And this was the first time that Joe had ever heard that happen, uh, you know, among any of the brethren. So they started speaking in tongues, and then Joe was like, I'm going to speak in tongues now. And he did. <laughs> and then, of course, um, when they were all gathered together in conference in uh, January, um, they all spoke in tongues and sang and praised in tongues. And then um, they all washed each other's feet. And then Joseph wiped them with his butt cloth. Um, yeah. The, the, now, I, I got to point out those those passages that I just read were separated by a few pages in the history of the church, but I included them together there to add some context of what you know speaking in tongues means. Now, Mormons today think that the gift of tongues is basically what missionaries get when they're learning a new language or a gift that believers get in extreme situations where God needs to speak through them or something. Now, this is a very nuanced and frankly inaccurate version of what Joe talked about when he recorded speaking in tongues in these passages. This is the kind of speaking in tongues that Pentecostals are known for doing now. I rebuke you and I curse that evil spirit within you that what you have done to destroy me this morning shall destroy you. I speak in tongues against you. You are an evil man. And you Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Father, fill this one. Fill her, Jesus. Let her just spill out, spill out her mouth, Father, in Jesus' name. You see what I mean? That is nothing like what believing Mormons consider speaking in tongues today. Although it, it is odd, because Mormons do believe that some people are gifted with speaking in the Adamic language or the perfect language before the Tower of Babel. And, you know, if I'm not mistaken, it's claimed that the plates were written in the perfect language that was actually called Reformed Egyptian when it was, you know, called under critical scrutiny. Now, I could be having a false memory there, but, but I think that's one of the claims about the gold plates, that it was written in the Adamic language. Well, Joe Brigham and apparently many others were tongue savants, <laughs> and I'm not talking, you know, sexually, uh, although given the number of women that most of these guys had, that could also be a possibility. And what I'm talking about is the gift of being able to randomly babble, you know, preposterously nonsense ramblings, and people think that it was some kind of lost language that God speaks. I know that this is absurd and not part of Mormon teachings today, but back in Joe's day, it happened plenty. And a lot of people were, you know, part of these religious sects that did you know, speak in tongues or, you know, like the shaking Quakers who would just tremble all over their body when they felt the spirit of the Lord. And, you know, these were all considered gifts from God. Now, the, these early accounts of November 1832 and January 1833 are the earliest times we hear of Joe speaking in tongues the way that the Pentecostals do today. This was all part of a bigger plan that Joe was working on to teach people his doctrine. This plan included the School of the Prophets, which was basically 
the Hitler Youth Joe edition, and it leads us into a discussion about the Doctrine and Covenants. The Doctrine and Covenants that are available today are you know, online or at an LDS retailer near you, like Deseret Book, are a little bastard child of what the original included. Initially, it started out as the Book of Commandments, which went to print in late 1832 and had limited production uh, throughout 1833. This was a collection of Joe's greatest hit revelations up to that point and ended at chapter 65. Soon after it went into print, Joe and company realized there were going to be a lot more revelations that would need to be included for the church to function with this book as part of its religious canon, which it is today. They would also need to include some lessons. So there would be more in the book than just boring revelations commanding people to do stuffs. So this led to the 1835 compilation of the Doctrine and Covenants. Now, the Doctrine and Covenants included a lot more revelations than just the Book of Commandments, and those were considered the Covenants part of the book. But the beginning had the lectures on faith, and that was the Doctrine part of the Doctrine and Covenants. That's why it's called the DNC, the Doctrine and Covenants. Now, the first part was the lectures on faith, that was the Doctrine part. The second part was the Covenants, or the most important revelations given up to 1835. That's the two separate parts of the Doctrine and Covenants. Now, the lectures on faith were the primary thing taught in the School of the Prophets that Joe started on January 23rd, 1833. Now, I'm not too informed on them, so I won't dive too deep into the lectures on faith now. But basically, they were a bunch of lectures or like question and answer articles that inform students or the reader on some basic tenets of Mormonism. Now, I gotta admit, I really look forward to reading them on my Book of Mormon with David because I have a feeling like they're going to push his show over the edge into Psychoville with Joe as like King Batshit Crazy Face. I'm really, really excited to get to those. And I find it an absolute shame that those lectures on faith have been removed from the current version. The doctrine part of the Doctrine and Covenants has been removed from the book. I mean, how are we to know the doctrine if it was taken out of the book called The Doctrine and Covenants. Unfortunately, I'm not terribly familiar with the historical context of when the doctrine was taken out of The Doctrine and Covenants, but I do know that the 1921 edition didn't have the doctrine part intact. Now, I, I wouldn't be surprised if some people could go to DI or like some yard sales in Utah and find some pre-1921 DNC with the lectures on faith still intact as the doctrine part. That would be awesome. But this is a call to action. Everybody that knows about this distinction should cease calling the Doctrine and Covenants Doctrine and Covenants. It should just be called the Book of Covenants, which is what I plan on calling it from now on. I mean, it's not the Doctrine and Covenants because the D is missing. That just leaves the C. Thus, any D and C published after 1921 will forever be known to me as just the Book of Covenants. From the little of them that I've read, these lectures on faith are quite fascinating. It really is a bit like the Hitler Youth Training Program, where Joe just tried to teach people, especially younger boys, about the doctrine of the church for the purposes of indoctrination. I mean, definitionally, it is indoctrination, and that's the best word to describe it. Now, we'll get into the details of the lectures on faith when my Book of Mormon gets there, however long it's going to take, maybe a couple of years, but it doesn't mean we can't talk about them conceptually as well as their impact on early Mormons. Now, I have to be clear here. The first School of the Prophets that Joe organized, which was also referred to as School of the Elders, was initially organized as a meeting place for the elders of the church, in which youth were not generally present. However, the Kirtland chapter was established in January of 33 and would dissolve in April of that same year, and soon after that, P. Cubed Barley Parker Pratt established one in Independence that had an attendance of roughly 60 people, some of which were children or young men there to learn the doctrine or be indoctrinated, thus the definition of that word. That school would dissolve when the Mormons were chased out of Independence. But have no fear, because bloody fucking Brigham would open up a shitload of them, two of which were in Provo and Eastern Salt Lake City. No... The Provo School of the Prophets didn't eventually become BYU Provo. But, and maybe this is a surprise to some, the Salt Lake City one was opened in connection to the University of Deseret, which later became the University of Utah. That's right, the University of Utah has a connection to the Mormon Hitler Youth. 
<laughs> I find that fascinating, whereas BYU does not. Uh, it's amazing. So even after that, John Taylor, the third prophet, would open up a couple of them in 1883, um, and those would last less than a year. Uh, reportedly, no other attempts have been made at starting the School of the Prophets unless there's one that exists today. You know, in the basement of the church office building where super secret Mormon stuff is, ha- you know, talked about or something. But you know, we won't talk about that. I, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. I doubt it. Joe opened up this school of the prophets and things went well for a little while, you know, in Kirtland here. It was a safe place where the elders could meet and have open discussion about the church and its doctrines without the pressure of it being a sermon in front of a crowd of parishioners. Now, after organizing this school of the prophets and recording what they discussed that would later become the doctrine in the 1835 Doctrine and Covenants, Joe and Rigdon basically finished their translation of the New Testament. While they had work to do elsewhere in the Bible, they, the inspired translation of the New Testament, including Revelation, was pretty much done. The Joseph Smith Bible was never printed by Joe and the church until after his death. Unfortunately, uh, the RLDS Church has the most complete manuscripts of the inspired translation of the Bible, which they have published. However, the Salt Lake City LDS Church has some of the other manuscripts that made the trek with Brigham Young. So... Joe's work in expanding on the Bible is considered altogether incomplete. To be clear, the the Mormon church today tries to distance itself from the Joseph Smith translation as much as possible, because if you read it, it's just absurd. It's not based off of any actual textual criticism or historical studies. It's just them, you know, it's just Joe and Rigdon reading the Bible and saying what, you know, translating it into words that they like. Or into like first person perspective on the, like on the Genesis account. It's it's just amazing. Mormons today only use the King James Bible in their canon. They they don't use the Joseph Smith translation. They try and ignore it. But you can find a full PDF copy of the Joseph Smith translation online with a quick Google search, or just by following the link in the show notes. I'll provide that. Um, I I have to say I absolutely love how this Joseph Smith translation was done. It was written in like an almost seance-like way. And Joe and Rigdon were in a room together, and they would ask God what was meant by a passage in the Bible. And then through divine revelation, the passage was clarified or properly dictated to a scribe, usually Rigdon or sometimes Joe. And then they would move on to the next passage that was challenging. It was basically a Joe and Rigdon Bible study on mushrooms. This is from the History of the Church, Volume 1, and it's their discernment of the Book of Revelation (laughs) in question-answer format. If anybody isn't familiar with the Book of Revelation, it's by far the craziest book in the Bible. It's just amazing. And this is Joe and Rigdon (laughs) trying to make sense of it. The book of Revelation is almost like the love child of J.R.R. Tolkien meets um, H.P. Lovecraft um, when they are really fucked up on mushrooms one night and then they they shit out the book of Revelation. It's just absolutely amazing. So if you want to find demons and dragons and uh, amazing, just, uh, uh, just, just read it. It's fire spitting juice. <laughs> <laughs> Just read the book of Revelation. But this is how Joe and Rigdon read it. In its question-answer format. Quote, What are we to understand by the four beasts spoken of in the same verse? They are figurative expressions, used by the revelator John in describing heaven, the paradise of God, the happiness of man, and of beasts, and of creeping things, and of the fowls of the air, that which is spiritual being in the likeness of that which is temporal, and that which is temporal in the likeness of that which is spiritual, the spirit of man in the likeness of his person, and also the spirit of the beast and every other creature which God has created. <sighs> Yep, that's how uh, that's how they explained the four beasts that are spoken of in the third chapter of Revelation. <laughs> um, question: What are we to understand by the eyes and wings which the beasts had? <laughs> yes, these beasts had wings, and they were covered in eyes, even on the underside of the wings. Yes, that's what happened. Answer, their eyes are a representation of light and knowledge. That is, they are full of knowledge, and their wings are a representation of power to move, to act, etc. <laughs> what the hell does that mean? What? What? They, that, that was just gobbledygook. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, question, what are we to understand by the book which John saw, which was sealed on the back with seven seals? Ooh, good question. 
Uh, answer, we are to understand that it contains the revealed will, mysteries, and works of God, the hidden things of his economy concerning this earth during the 7,000 years of its continuance or its temporal existence. Uh, so, like, he was saying that each seal means a thousand years, and then, it, so the, the earth's going to continue for 7,000 years, and then it's, uh, you know, that's that's it, that's the end of uh, what, uh, I... <sighs> I don't know. I, I don't know. During its seven thousand years of its continuance, I, I mean, that it just it doesn't make sense. I don't know what to ask. It's just absurd. Uh, next question: What are we to understand by sealing the one hundred and forty-four thousand out of all the tribes of Israel? Twelve thousand out of every tribe. That's a good question too, because I think that's uh, that's something that a lot of people that read the Book of Revelation wrestle with. It says only one hundred and forty-four thousand people, twelve thousand from each tribe of Israel, will be saved. Um, so let's see how, how God answers this one. We are to understand that those who are sealed as high priests ordain unto the holy order of God to administer the everlasting gospel for they are they who are ordained out of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people by the angels to whom is given power over the nations of the earth to bring as many as will come to the church of the firstborn. (sighs) My brain. The Christian-y crap is just, like, infecting my brain. What what does that, all of that mean? S- who are sealed as high priests. So everybody that's a high priest um, that can, uh, that's ordained in the Holy Order of God, administer the, the everlasting gospel, and can do all of that, those are the 144,000 that will be raptured, and everybody else is screwed? I, 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 I the Bible is just confusing in and of itself when you have two people that are, you know, 19th century country bumpkins trying to figure this out. It makes it even more challenging. Uh, well, OK, I should say Rigdon wasn't much of a country bumpkin. He was a pretty damn smart dude. But Joseph was and he was, you know, he obviously he was getting his country bumpkinness all over this question. What are we to understand by the little book, which was eaten by John, <laughs> as mentioned in the 10th chapter of Revelations? <laughs> Yes, John ate a book. (laughs) We are to understand that it was a mission and an ordinance for him to gather the tribes of Israel. Behold, this is Elias, who, as it is written, must come and restore all things. What does that have to do with a guy eating a book? (laughs) What? What? Uh, I don't understand. It's just so absurd. Uh, the next question, are the four beasts limited to individual beasts or do they represent classes or orders? They are limited to four individual beasts, which were shown to John to represent the glory of the classes of beings in their destined order or sphere of creation in the enjoyment of their eternal felicity. So, you know, somebody asked, one of them asked an either or question, um, are they individual beasts or do they represent classes or, or orders? And the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, that it's just amazing. I, I mean, okay. That was a large portion of them, but that wasn't all of them. I got to I, 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 Just go and check it out yourself. History of the church. Volume one has this. It's really hilarious. them trying to parse out what <laughs> revelation is about. But oddly enough, that scripture study stopped at chapter 10 of Revelation. They didn't continue after that. I mean, the last half of that book is when really insane stuff happens. I mean, why why would they just stop at chapter 10? There's 22 chapters. I really wish I could see the exchange of Joe and Rigdon trying to figure out like the fire-breathing zombie Jews and God killing everyone in an earthquake and, and uh, like lightning and shooting out of the Ark of the Covenant and the naked eagle woman giving birth on the moon and like the seven headed 10 horned dragon. And those were just chapters 11 and 12. I mean, how would God answer the question of what are we to understand by the eagle woman clothed in sunlight giving birth on the moon only to be chased by the seven headed dragon Satan that makes a river of blood to catch the eagle woman and try to eat her baby. I mean, how would God answer that question out of those? Why did they have to stop at chapter 10? Oh, I'm so frustrated. Oh, well, oh, well, I mean, this is, I to, just thinking about it, this is probably why the translation was never actually completed. I mean, imagine being Joe and Rigdon sitting down and having like this seance writing session every day, 
grinding through the Bible, chapter after chapter, book after book. It must have been so taxing and just arduous and tenacious to, to embark upon this task. And it was all happening during a time when they were busy with lots of other important things that were going on in the church. I mean, I can't imagine trying to take the time to do this while setting up a printing press and dealing with missionaries, squashing insurrections, borrowing money to keep the bankrupt church afloat, and all the while being beat and persecuted by people that didn't like something the Mormons were doing. I I admit, I commend them for their effort, but I just think that if God did indeed call upon Joe and Rigdon to perform a task such as translating the Bible, he would make it possible for them to do so, or at least like hold them to completing their task once they started it. I really wish that it were actually complete. Now, of course, translating the Bible wasn't the only thing that Joe and Rigdon team was good for. They loved to pump out new revelations that would be included in the Doctrine and Covenants. And the next one in our timeline that came along was the Word of Wisdom. Now, I've mentioned the Word of Wisdom before, but I don't think I've actually deconstructed it on the show. Well, it's pertinent in our timeline now, so let's see what the Word of Wisdom says and really try to parse out the important details. You can also check out my guest spot on Country Fried Free Thought Podcast to hear a discussion about the Word of Wisdom. A bit of that is going to be parroted here. But the Doctrine and Covenants 1835 edition, section 80, is as follows. Notice I called it the Doctrine and Covenants there because in 1835 that's what it was. I didn't call it the Book of Covenants because I didn't take it from the, uh, the current day one. Quote, A word of wisdom for the benefit of the Council of High Priests assembled in Kirtland and Church, and also the Saints of Zion to be sent greeting, not by commandment or constraint, but by revelation and the word of wisdom showing forth the order and will of God in the temporal salvation of all the saints in the last days, given for a principle with promise, adapted to the capacity of the weak and the weakest of all saints who are or can be called saints, end quote. All right, that was just the heading, and it should be noted that this didn't just come out of thin air. I mean, a lot of people were coming up with ideas on, like, diet restriction and cleanliness and overall good living. I mean, sanitariums were just starting up, you know, and they were starting to trend in the burned-over district and elsewhere. I mean, Ellen G. White, Alexander Campbell, William Miller, and a lot of other people that were pushing good living or diet restrictions were just on the verge of becoming popular or already had become popular. I mean, dietary advice was a common topic of discussion in the time that the Word of Wisdom was born out of. But there was also another pressure. Emma. This is taken from the Journal of Discourses, Volume 12, and it's quoting Bloody Brigham. We'll get back to the Word of Wisdom in a second. Quote, When they assembled together in this room after breakfast, this is referring to the School of the Prophets, the first they did was to light up their pipes, and while smoking, talking about the great things of the kingdom, and spit all over the room, and as soon as the pipe was out of their mouth, a large chew of tobacco would then be taken. Often when the prophet entered the room to give the school instructions, he would find himself in a cloud of tobacco smoke. This and the complaints of his wife at having to clean so filthy a floor made the prophet think upon the matter. And he inquired of the Lord relating to the conduct of the elders in using tobacco and the revelation known as the word of wisdom was the result of his inquiry. End quote. Now, a lot of believing Mormons will tout this little story from Brigham Young and say that Joe was just in touch with God and God merely waited for Joe to ask about tobacco in order to give him a full revelation on the dietary and health restrictions that the church would embrace. That was a word of wisdom. They will even say that this set the Mormon church apart from every other church out there because science hadn't told people that bad food and tobacco were actually bad things yet, making Joe a visionary and giving this revelation. And that's just blatantly false and obviously born out of an ignorance of history. A lot of religions and scientists alike were investigating the positive effects of a good diet and the ill effects of tobacco and alcohol during Joe's time. He was merely taking what people were talking about and putting it in one place and calling it divine revelation from God, just like everything else Joe ever did, ever, ever. He just synthesized things that were around him and called it his own. I also find it fascinating that Emma was you know, getting pissed at Joe because she had to clean up the floor of the School of the Prophets that was covered in nasty old tobacco spit, reeking of spittoons and pipe smoke. I mean, it took the wisdom and persistence of a woman to make Joe ask God about how bad tobacco is for you. How can this be considered divinely inspired? 
Uh, anyway, let's get back to the actual meat of the word of wisdom and see if we can't figure out just how wise it really was. Quote, Behold, verily, thus saith the Lord unto you, in consequence of evils and designs which do and will exist in the hearts of conspiring men in the last days, I have warned you and forewarn you by giving unto you this word of wisdom by revelation, that inasmuch as any man drinketh wine or strong drink among you, behold, it is not good, neither meet in the sight of your father, only in assembling yourselves together to offer up sacraments before him. Okay, so there it said that um, wine and strong drink isn't good for you. Um, you know, that's uh, in moderation or, you know, just once a day. Yeah, that's not a problem, actually. Alcohol is, you know, in very, very small doses, alcohol is all right for you. And, you know, there are some benefits to it. But, uh, you know, in large portions and binging, no, of course, that's not good for you. And it, just like anything else with moderation, it's okay. Um, let's see. It goes on to say, and behold, this should be wine, yea, pure wine of the grape of the vine of your own make. Oh, there you go. So um, it says that you shouldn't be drinking wine or strong drinks unless you are assembling yourself together to offer sacraments. And that should be wine that you yourself make. That's quite fascinating. That, that is a caveat that's put in here. You can use wine for sacrament as long as you make it yourself. And let's see. And again, strong drinks are not for the belly, but for the washing of your bodies. Well, you know, strong drinks are, you know, I, I guess alcohol does clean out, you know, wounds and whatnot. So that's, that's good. But, uh, you know, I, 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 what I envision here is like taking a bath in like whiskey and it's like, yeah, that'd probably get me really drunk, but it doesn't sound like it would be good for washing, actually washing myself. Anyway, uh, let's see. And again, tobacco is not for the body, neither for the belly, and is not good for man, but is an herb for bruises, and all sick cattle to be used with judgment and skill. Okay, fair enough. So, um, you, when cattle are, you know, are plugged up or whatever, you feed them a little tobacco and then it cleans them out. So that's cool. You know, fantastic. It's a diuretic. That makes sense. Um, tobacco isn't for the body or the belly, and it's not good for man, but an herb for bruises. And that's fair too, because people for a long time have used, you know, rubbed tobacco or a little bit of grass on bruises, and that supposedly, uh, you know, helps it heal faster. I don't know if there's any science behind that, but it's it's something that's still practiced today in some places. So, you know, whatever, that's cool. Um, to be used with judgment and skill, fair enough. Uh, the next thing it says, and again, hot drinks are not for the body or the belly. Okay, there it is, hot drinks. So all you Mormons out there, no more fucking hot cocoa. You can have cold cocoa, you can have cold coffee, iced coffee, cold tea, uh, but you can't have hot drinks. They're not for the body or belly. Simple as that. Stop drinking hot drinks. It doesn't matter what it is. Hot chocolate, hot coffee, hot anything. Um, and again, verily I say unto you, all wholesome herbs God hath ordained for the constitution, nature, and use of man. Uh, uh, er, herbs. Uh, there you go. Mormons can smoke weed. <laughs> it's right there, right in the, the word of wisdom. E weed is a wholesome herb, and there it is. Um, every herb in the season thereof, and every fruit in the season thereof. Yep, it's ordained for the constitution and use of man. There it is. Toke up, Mormons, toke it up. All these to be used with prudence and thanksgiving. Yea, flesh also of beasts and of fowls of the air. I, the Lord, hath ordained for the use of man with thanksgiving. Nevertheless, they are to be used sparingly. And it is pleasing unto me that they should not be used only in times of winter or of cold or famine. All okay, so there you go. So um, eating flesh of beasts and fowl of the air, um, they should be eaten sparingly. And they should be used only in times of famine or of winter or cold because um, those are the times when uh, herbs and fruits and whatnot are not in season. So, yeah, uh, Mormons, stop eating so much meat. Eat it sparingly, damn it, or else you're you're breaking the word of wisdom and you can't have your, your temple recommend. So, yeah, keep that in mind. All grain is ordained for the use of men and of beasts to be the staff of life. Not only for man, but for the beasts of the field and the fowls of heaven, and all wild animals that run or creep on the earth. And these hath God made for the use of man only in times of famine and excess of hunger. So, uh, what what are you supposed to eat if you're only supposed to eat these these you know grains and meats in you know times of famine and excess of hunger, and you're only supposed to eat 
fruit and herbs in the season thereof. What, what are you just supposed to eat every single day then? I, I don't get it. Uh, I don't know. It, that, that just seems absurd. Um, but it's, it's very well in line with like the, the Kellogg food pyramid or whatever uh, that has come up with, you know, grains are kind of the, the station, you know, carbohydrates are at the bottom of the food pyramid because they should be the majority of what you eat. We know that's not true now, but I mean, it was at this time in the 19th century, that's what they thought was you know healthy and what was most beneficial for a proper diet. So, well, I can't fault Joe for having the perspective that most people had of that time of grains and um, oats and whatnot. So I I can't fault Joe for that. That's it, it wasn't necessarily unique, but it was progressive. So um, all grain is good for the food of man and also the fruit of the vine, that which yieldeth fruit, whether in the ground or above the ground. Nevertheless, wheat for man, and corn for the ox, and oats for the horse, and rye for the fowls, and for swine, and for all beasts of the field. So telling everybody what to feed their animals. Okay, fair enough. I, I They were probably doing that before this and didn't need that, that explicit instruction, but okay. Uh, let's see. And barley for all useful animals and for mild drinks as also other grain. You hear that? You can use barley and also other grain for mild drinks. You hear that, Mormons? Crack open that beer. Crack open that barley or wheat beer or whatever grain beer that you want and just have one on me. That is so fantastic. The word of wisdom right here explicitly says mild drinks are good. And what is a mild drink that has barley or grain other than beer? Ah, beautiful, beautiful. Mormons, get to drinking some beer already. <laughs> Uh, I love Mormon history. And all saints who remember to keep and do these sayings, walking in obedience to the commandments, shall receive health in their navel and marrow to their bones and shall find wisdom and great treasures of knowledge, even hidden treasures, and shall run and not be weary and shall walk and not be faint. And I, the Lord, give unto them a promise that the destroying angel shall pass by them as the children of Israel and not slay them. Amen. End quote. Well, yeah, fuck you too. I mean, that's a nice little death threat at the end there, isn't it? I mean, that's the implication. That's that's what we're supposed to take from this, right? If you follow the word of wisdom, the destroying angel will pass you by. But if you don't, he'll stop at your house and slay the firstborn of your family, just like the children of Israel. Isn't that sweet? I, I mean, if this was indeed a life and death revelation, as implied at the very last sentence, why would God wait until three years into the church to tell Joe about it? And for that matter, why wouldn't this entire passage be in the Bible somewhere? Because it's obviously an important tenet of the one true church. I mean, my point is, this so-called revelation given to Joe by divine authority wasn't unique. It didn't come out of the blue. I mean... It skipped important things, and it included non-important restraints, and altogether was nothing more than a 19th century progressive perspective of health and diet in general. The word of wisdom didn't set the Mormon church apart from other churches in the slightest. It's arguable that today it's rather antiquated. I mean, the word of wisdom is, I mean, kind of absurd with a couple of things. I mean, with some conclusions about the hot drinks and whatnot, it, uh, they're completely inaccurate. The thing is that that was the original word of wisdom. That revelation has very, very little to do with Mormonism today. I mean, today they forbid hot drinks, but, you know, they forbid hot coffee, but not hot cocoa. They forbid beer, even though the word of wisdom has a direct exception line for mild barley or grain drinks. They forbid wine, even though it's expressly allowed and commanded for use in sacrament. They recommend herbs, fruits, and grains to be consumed in their season, but with factory farming nowadays, nobody does that anymore. Mormons don't smoke weed, even though that's a wholesome herb. It commands meat to be used sparingly, but go into the majority of Mormon households on a Sunday afternoon, and you're bound to find huge portions of steak, roast chicken, or fish taking over the majority of the plate real estate. I mean, the church used to forbid caffeinated drinks, but currently owns stock in Coca-Cola, so that's out the fucking window. I mean, given the church's current stance on the word of wisdom, it's a lot like their perspective of a lot of other revelations in the Book of Covenants. If it gets in the way, just forget about it and come up with your own bullshit that will pass and command it to be taught from the pulpit. 
No big deal. In that case, what the fuck does this Book of Covenants even mean? I mean, David and I have figured out that nobody reads the damn thing from beginning to end because they just couldn't do it and stay sane. So why even keep the little bastard of a holy book around? It just doesn't even matter anymore. I mean, and beyond that, it's been even further bastardized because the doctrine part has been taken out of the Doctrine and Covenants. I mean, it just doesn't even matter. If your founding prophet comes up with hundreds of revelations and you just end up ignoring the vast majority of them that become inconvenient anyway, why even pretend? Why even call this Joseph's Mormon Church? I mean, why? It just, it doesn't hold any semblance of reality. It doesn't hold any connection to what actually happened in the history. I mean, I I come into conflict with these questions every time I put an episode together. It seems like there's so much in Mormon church that's obfuscated or just weird somehow, and they have this rich, beautiful history that fascinates anybody willing to give it some time and open inquiry, yet it doesn't seem to matter one damn bit to the church. One of the questions in the Temple Recommend interview is, do you keep the word of wisdom? If you answer this question with anything other than yes, you run the risk of being denied your temple recommend, meaning that you can't go to Mormon super awesome world over lore heaven. Well, I would merely ask what they mean by that question. If they're talking about their own version of the word of wisdom, it's so debased and corrupted from what the book of covenants that you're forced to ignorantly bark back yes without thinking because you don't drink coffee or smoke cigarettes and that's all that matters to them if they're asking that question in regards to the original word of wisdom that we just read no believing mormon follows that anymore so you can't answer that question with an honest yes i have a solution to this problem though I petition any believer in the audience, which I doubt there are many, if any, at all, to just drink beer, smoke some wholesome herbs, never eat tomatoes in the spring, and bring your own flask of homebrew wine to drink during sacrament service. And if anybody asks you if you're following the word of wisdom, you can rest assured that you are following Joseph Smith's word of wisdom much closer than they are. All right, let's let's kind of leave the word of wisdom behind and advance the timeline a little further into 1833 here. In February, Illinois outlawed polygamy. Polygamy was actually the main thing that kept the Utah Territory from becoming a sanctioned state in the 1890s because it was seen as one of the twins of barbarism, the other of which is slavery. This outlawing would prove to be a big problem for Joe and the church and played into the reasoning behind Joe burning down the printing press that released the Mormon Expositor in 1844, ultimately leading to his death in Carthage. I feel like I've made my own position on polygamy very clear, but I can agree with the reasons behind passing such a law by the Illinois legislature. They, they were trying to protect the people in a polygamous relationship that were powerless, I mean, I can get behind passing laws that protect women and children that are, you know, subservient to an abusive patriarchal family structure that seems to necessarily rise from polygyny. No, I, I didn't say polygamy, I said polygyny, because polygyny is a very specific subsect of polyamory in general, where it's patriarchal, where there's one man with multiple women and lots of kids. And, uh, you know, that's, that's what Mormon polygamy was, was specifically polygyny. Um, what, what I'm trying to say is that it's a good thing that the law was passed, even though I don't think that the government should have any hand in the marriage business. Just fundamentally, I don't necessarily agree with that, but I'm also a little bit butthurt that this law sort of played a hand in getting Joe shot because I really, really wanted to see where the church would have gone if he didn't die in 1844 and just was able to run hog wild for more years. I, I want to see where Joe eventually would have taken the church if his life wasn't cut short. But regardless, it's still a good thing that Illinois passed the, the anti-polygamy law. So in May of 1833, Dr. Philastus Hurlbut uh, returned from his mission in Conneaut, where he learned of the connections between Solomon Spalding's manuscript found and the Book of Mormon. On June 3rd, he was excommunicated, the reasoning for which was unchristian-like conduct with females, quote-unquote. And we, you know, we don't really know what happened, but promiscuity was often cited when the church kicked out somebody that needed to go. Um, but it also needs to be said that Hurlbut had also been kicked out of four other congregations for similar charges, 
So there was probably some merit to the reason of unchristian-like conduct with females. He probably did a little <laughs> bit of fooling around some hanky-panky. Uh, the weird thing about this is his excommunication was appealed, and he was reinstated on June 21st. He was then re-excommunicated on June 23rd, only to embark on a campaign against the church, the likes of which Joe and Rigdon had never seen. Hurlbutt will be the focus of our next historical timeline episode, so we'll leave him alone for now and attend to other important things. You know, while he's making his trip back to Conneaut, then to Boston and Hartwick, just like Joe had done, uh, you know, seven months earlier. So on June 25th, we bid Dick Zybin Peterson farewell forever. He exits our timeline, having very little impact on the story as a whole. I mean... He would later become a sheriff of a town in California that would come to be known as Hangtown because he hanged so many people there. But that's it for Dick Zybin Peterson in our story. And, you know, all is well. He he was a little apathetic towards the church anyway, so when the church was being chased out here, he just stayed. One very important thing that does happen on July 20th, 1833, is the cornerstone of the temple was laid. This marked the first big development of the spreading of the Mormon church. They finally had the resources necessary to create not only a church, but an entire temple for the sole purpose of conducting ceremonies. The dedication of this temple is known as quite the epic story in Mormon history. People claim that there were angels flying around and that Joe and Ollie saw Moses and Elijah and there were babies that stood on chairs and swung handkerchiefs over their head in celebration and people were falling all over the place and babbling in tongues and all kinds of wackadoo goofy antics. And we'll get to that when it happens in 1836, but for now just keep in mind the construction of the temple uh, began on July 20th, 1833 when the cornerstone was laid in Kirtland. Ohio. This is the Kirtland Temple, not the Nauvoo Temple. I should make that abundantly clear. Kirtland, not Nauvoo. Now, July to August is about the time frame when the Book of Commandments was first published, and this scared a lot of people in Missouri, you know, non-Mormons specifically, because it somehow seemed to legitimize the church. The citizens of Independence had come to an agreement with the Mormons that they would be out in one year's time. The Mormons had promised to leave by August of 1834, which only forced them to ramp up production of the Book of Commandments and other proprietary church publications, one might call propaganda. This also effectively created an influx of missionary work. If the Mormons could convert enough people to Mormonism in Missouri, they might not be forced to leave, and this made them desperate to hold on to Zion nearly by any means necessary. And remember, Zion, this Jackson County, Missouri, was a place where Joe had made a, given a revelation that this would be the place where rapture was coming. So this, this place was a hot commodity for anybody that believed in Mormonism or Joseph Smith as a prophet. This is understandable, though. The revelation that Joe gave calling independence the New Zion had a few ulterior effects that the church had to deal with. For the followers of Mormonism, it put a target on Zion as the new place that Jesus would return to, and this engendered a brand new, like, extreme effort to proselyte and purchase land in Zion so the believers would have their place in heaven secured once rapture time came along. But that made the non-Mormons a little antsy making the flip side a little less pleasant for the Mormons. The massive influx of Mormons to Missouri scared a lot of non-Mormons, especially people that didn't like them in the first place. A lot of people that viewed them just saw them as another cult, you know, no different from the dozens of others that were cropping up. Additionally, a, a lot of people in Missouri didn't like the abolitionist ideals that a lot of Mormons held, and even more, people simply thought that the Mormons were just of the devil and wanted nothing to do with them. So it's, you know, it's hard to simply ignore them when they're moving in by the dozens and claiming the land as their new Zion, where the Mormon empire would be constructed before the second coming of Jesus. That's just the theological conflicts that that poses between Mormons and any other religious or Christian sect. It just inherently is going to be a problem no matter what. This The thing I'm about to read is an extract from the book of John Goebbels Whitmer. It's a letter from the people of Missouri representing a formal complaint against the Mormons. So it was, it, it was written by the Missourians, um, and it's really, you know, kind of captures the feeling that the Missourians had towards this, you know, this influx of new Mormons. Quote, 
In a late number of The Star, printed in Independence by the leaders of the sect, there is an article inviting free Negroes and mulattoes from other states to become Mormons and move and settle among us. This exhibits them in still more odious colors and manifests a desire on the part of their society to inflict on our society an injury that they know would be to us entirely unsupportable and one of the surest means of driving us from the country, for it would require none of the supernatural gifts that they pretend to, to see that the introduction of such a caste among us would corrupt our black and instigate them to bloodshed. They openly blaspheme the Most High God and cast contempt on his holy religion by pretending to receive revelations direct from heaven by pretending to speak in unknown tongues, by direct inspiration and by divine pretensions derogatory of God and religion into the utter subversion of human reason, end quote. So basically, Missouri was a contentious slave state. It was acquired during the Louisiana Purchase, and the people argued if it should be considered a free state or a slave state, because it was north of the uh, traditional slave state line. The decision came down and locked Missouri in as a slave state, and set it as the northernmost boundary for a state that would be incorporated after it. So, to be clear, that's one of the big problems that the Missourians had with the Mormons, is they were trying to teach the... uh, the freed slaves or the uh, the mulattoes, as it says here, that they should uh, become Mormons, and they they thought that might threaten the economy of Missouri because it will cause the Mormons or it will cause the other uh, other slaves that were currently working for people in Missouri to uh, instigate them to bloodshed. You know, it would or it would maybe engender a possibility of a coup or something like that. And, of course, the whites did not want that. The white people, the slave owners, did not want their slaves uprising because that was, you know, what their entire lifestyle was based off of. They didn't want to go work the fields themselves. They wanted black people to work the fields for them for, you know, free labor. So, you know, that that's where this existential crisis comes in. And that's where a lot of points were coming into conflict with the Mormons as opposed to the Missourians. So with Missouri, it was extremely contentious. So any state that was um, incorporated that was north of the southern border of Missouri would be considered a free state, and any state that was south of it would be considered a slave state. Now, it seems like it was a vocal minority that was able to pass this slave state legislation there. And this same vocal minority saw the Mormons that were trying to invite slaves to join the church and read the Book of Mormon. Oh no, don't teach them to read. And, you know, it posed a threat to them. The Evening and Morning Star had published the newspaper article that was inviting, quote, all free Negroes and mulattoes to join the church, end quote. And, of course, the slave owners or even slavery sympathizers saw this as, like, you know, a turd in the punch bowl. And it was possibly the first steps towards Missouri becoming a free state, which threatened everything they loved so much about their lives. I mean, white slave owners' lives were so goddamn easy when all of the work was being done by black slaves. It's just absolutely horrible but i mean it's understandable that they were trying to protect their livelihood and you know keep their economy going the way that it was going now you see slavery and racism has plagued missouri for a long time it's not just with ferguson recently in the news it's it's been going on systematically for a couple hundred years now if i'm not mistaken missouri is also where the dred scott decision was made but you know that could be my own brain conflating stuff there but i think that was the case the point is The Missourians didn't like the Mormons that were trying to teach slaves how to read and invite freed slaves to join their church. If the African Americans were going to rise up against their slave owners, the Missourians thought the start of it could be the damn Mormons teaching them how to read the Book of Mormon. And they just wouldn't have that. They also thought that the Mormons were preaching a false god, which is an even bigger problem when it comes to Christianity, oddly. Most non-Mormons thought that old Joe Smith was possessed by the devil and he was leading people away from the one true word of God or that either that or they just didn't like those kooky Mormons or they were completely indifferent to him. Regardless, there were very few non-Mormons that sympathized with the Mormons and would actually come to their defense. In Kirtland, that wasn't so much the case, but in Missouri, where the Mormons were quickly infecting the population, the locals were really opposed to the new crazy Mormonites. The letter that we read led to a formal complaint raised against the Mormons, giving rise to illegal persecution and legal prosecution. 
By the end of that letter, the Missourians decided to hold a town meeting during which they vote to destroy the Mormons' printing press. I'll let John Goebbels walk us through what happened next here. Quote, a committee was appointed at the foregoing meeting and waited on us, Edward Partridge, party boy, John Coral, Phelps, double dub Phelps, Cowdery, Ollie Cowdung, etc., to answer them this question, will you leave this county or not? Allowing us only 15 minutes to answer the question. We did not make any reply at that time. The committee further required of us to shut up our printing office, store, mechanical shops, etc. immediately and leave the county. When they found that we were unwilling to comply with their requests, they returned to the courthouse and voted to erase the printing office to the ground, which they immediately did, and at the same time took Edward Partridge and Charles Allen and tarred and feathered them, threatening to kill us if we did not leave the county immediately. They were also determined to demolish the store. A.S. Gilbert, or Asa Gilbert, prevailed on them to let it stand until Tuesday next and have time to pack his goods himself. Uh, well, that's fantastic. So, you know, they, uh, well, I mean, that's not fantastic. But it, all of it isn't fantastic. But the, the whole thing with Asa Gilbert, he was able to uh, to convince everybody to not burn his store to the ground, but to uh, just uh, to leave and he would pack up his own shit himself and then he would transport it so they don't have to, uh, you know, they, they're not faced with a lawsuit for all of the goods that he had purchased uh and you know of course that the printing press was uh torn to the ground um it destroyed everything inside it all of the publications and then edward partridge and charles allen who were you know kind of running the press at the time were taken outside and tarred and feathered and beat and it's just it's a horrible situation um Tuesday arrived and death and destruction stared us in the face. The whole county turned out and surrounded us, came to William Wines Phelps, took my house and took us upon the public square, as also Partridge, Coral, Morley, who was Yellow and Morley, and Gilbert, and were determined to massacre us unless we agreed to leave the county immediately. Finally, we agreed to leave upon the following condition, end quote. So basically, Jackson County wasn't having any more of the Mormons. They were done with them, and they took extremely illegal measures to get them out. The mob first held a town meeting trying to get the Mormons to agree to leave. When the Mormons didn't give them any definite answer, they took to the streets and burned the printing press down and attempted to destroy Asa Gilbert's goods store. After all that happened, they held another meeting trying to chase the Mormons out again, and the Mormons signed an agreement to be out by January 1834. The agreement had a few clauses that restricted any Mormon growth in the interim period. They couldn't establish anything else. They couldn't publish any more books or publications, nor could they set up a replacement printing press to attempt to print anything new. Whatever copies remained from the initial printing of the hymn book, the Book of Commandments, and the Evening and Morning Star were the only publications that would come out of Missouri from then on. Asid Gilbert also couldn't import anything new into his store, but was allowed to sell the remainder of his goods. The Mormons couldn't acquire any new housing, nor could any new Mormons move to Missouri to live with those that already were residing there. Now, it should be noted here, just as a side note, that one of the few people living in Jackson that was sympathetic to the Mormons at the time was Lieutenant Governor Lilburn Boggs, who was housing a few of the Mormons that were being shut out of Missouri during this time period in the summer of 1833. So, that's just worth pointing out, Lilburn Boggs wasn't necessarily opposed to the Mormons at this time. You know, the agreements that the Missourians agreed to that persuaded the Mormons to sign this get-the-fuck-out order were asylum and ease of passage. The people of Jackson County agreed to allow the Mormons to peacefully disband, leave, and come and go as necessary to wrap up business until they were all gone, as long as the majority of the Mormons were gone by January of 1834 and the rest of them by, you know, kind of spring to summertime-ish, April to August 34. This whole protest and everything that happened was more symbolic than it was actually functional. Legally speaking, the Mormons were on high ground here. The Missourians had destroyed their printing press, which is an act of tyranny or censorship, making it a constitutional violation. And the mob had also destroyed a fair amount of the Mormons' property and housing. And during this initial mob, a lot of people fled to Clay County or, or even back to Kirtland, taking only the clothes on their back or what few possessions they could carry for their voyage. And don't forget, this was a violent mob with guns, torches, and pitchforks. They wanted Mormon blood and they eventually got it. But like I said, the Mormons were legally on the high ground here. They were the ones being chased out of their legally acquired housing. So, 
I mean, it's kind of a it's kind of a crapshoot. It's a little bit of a wash when you talk about who uh, who was actually in the right and who was in the wrong here. The next passage in John Goebel's history is amazing. Everything we've discussed today is on page 40 to 45 of his own personal history, and there will be a link to that in the show notes. And I recommend checking it out just to get a feel for how he recounted his history and, you know, really for how he got his, uh, his name or nickname here. The passage is, quote, The battle was fought on the evening of November 3rd, and only one of the brethren was killed and two of the mob. David Whitmer headed the disciples, end quote. And that's it. The line before that was the signatories of the agreement that we just discussed, and the next line after it is on the next page, and it's a new entry. I mean, th- this is a shame, because it leaves so much out, and doesn't enlighten us at all to the general feeling in Jackson County during this time. I mean, uh, don't get me wrong now, the accounts sounded quite unpleasant, you know, a battle with a few deaths, but it doesn't really capture what it was like to be there. For a more detailed version of the events of late October to early November of 1833, let's dabble into Philo Dibble Dabble's autobiography once again, which will be linked uh, in the show notes like it was last episode. This passage is a little bit longer, but it's much better to gain a proper understanding of the situation, and it will take us to the end of the historical portion of today's episode. I gotta admit, I read the first part of this, but I stopped myself because... It was just too good, and I want us all to experience the totality of this account for the first time all together. So I hope you're ready to uh, embark on this journey with me. It's going to be a party. Quote, In the fall of 1833, a sectarian preacher by the name of Isaac McCoy came to the Whitmer settlement where I was living to buy up all the guns he could, representing that he wanted them for the Indians. We suspected no trouble, and quite a number of us sold our guns to him. The sequel of his action was, however, soon apparent to us, for rumors soon reached us of mobs assembling and threats being made to drive us from the county. Oh shit, here we go. Yeah, so this guy McCoy went into the Whitmer settlement, um, where the the Acid Gilbert shop was, and he said, hey, we're having a problem with Indians, can I buy all your guns? And they're like, sure, no problem. Um, but then they found out that they just did that so that the Mormons would be disarmed, which is pretty clever, i got to admit. When the mob first began to gather and threaten us, I was selected to go to another county and buy powder and lead. The brethren gave me privilege of choosing a man to go with me. I took with me a man by the name of John Poorman. If we remember back to John Poorman, that, that was a guy who... Uh, During the Rigdon and Joe beating and tarring and feathering in Hiram, Ohio, John Poorman was the dude who hit, uh, um, uh, uh, John, uh, John Johnson, right? Um, yeah, the, the Johnson family home, that's, that's where Joe was living. He hit, uh, John Johnson in the head with a stone or something and then thought that he had killed him, uh, just in the, the fray. They, they both were friends and they, thought that they were each somebody else and, you know, part of the mob or whatever, and they tried to kill each other. <laughs> but that's the guy that um, uh, Dibble Dabble took with him to Clay County to buy some uh, powder and shot for the, the confrontation that was about to happen. We thought we were good for four of the mob. We went to the town of Liberty, Clay County, and purchased the ammunition and returned safely. Soon after I returned, October 31st, 1833, a mob of about 150 came upon us in the dead hour of night, tore down a number of our houses and whipped and abused several of our brethren. I was aroused from my sleep by the noise caused by the falling of houses, and had barely time to escape to the woods with my wife and two children, when they reached my house and proceeded to break in the door and tear the roof off. I was some distance away from where the whipping occurred, but I heard the blows of heavy ox goads upon the backs of my brethren distinctly. Holy shit. So they were beating these guys with ox goads. Oh, that's, oh, that's so brutal. I I can't even imagine the pain of that. I I can't even just imagine the pain of lashings in general. That's just absolutely insane. They just, this mob of 150 guys just stormed in, ripped Mormons out of their houses, tore the houses down behind them, and then dragged them out into the street and just beat the fuck out of them. God, oh, it's messed up. 
The mob also swore they would tear down our grist mill, which was situated at the Colesville branch, about three miles from the settlement, unless they should really do so. And as it was the only means we had of getting our grain ground, we were counseled to gather there and defend it. We accordingly proceeded there the next morning. The following night, two men came into our camp, pretending they wanted to hire some men to work for them. Brother Parley Pratt ordered them to be taken prisoners, when one of them struck him a glancing blow on the head with his gun, inflicting a severe wound. Oh! We then disarmed them and kept them as prisoners until morning, when we gave them back their arms and let them go. Holy crap, that's insane. Okay, so... These two guys, so, okay, the Mormons were scared that they were going to, uh, the mob was going to tear down their grist mill the next day. So they gathered there together, and then two guys came wandering into the camp, and they were like, hey, we, uh, we need to hire a couple guys for work. But of course, the, the Mormons saw through that ruse and were like, no, you're just going to take us off and kill us, so fuck you. So P cubed here ordered these guys to be taken as prisoners and one of them grabbed the his gun and you know hit pratt on the head with it oh oh my god that's insane so at that point they disarmed these guys and took them as prisoners that is seen as a very aggressive action taking these guys as prisoners you know whether or not the missourians sent these guys as you know actual recruiters to try and kill some mormons or whatever the the ruse was that they were trying to pull here Regardless of that, it was still quite aggressive to take two guys prisoners and hold them all night without their guns at, you know, holding them at gunpoint. So I understand where some more aggression would be coming from engendered from just that single action alone. You know, judging from everything that was happening before that, I don't think that uh, P cubed was unjustified in doing this and taking these guys as prisoners and they hit him on the head. Uh, but still, I I can see where the Missourians might see that as a, being an aggressive action by the Mormons, where it justifies escalation. The next day, we heard firing down on the Whitmer settlement. Holy shit. And 17 of our brethren volunteered to go down and see what it meant. Brother George Beebe was one of these volunteers and also one of the men who was whipped the night previous. Oh, no shit. So this George Beebe guy. Uh, oh, hang on. Brother BB carried the marks of this whipping to his grave. Oh, my God. As the brethren who laid him out at the time of his death in December 81 at Provo, Utah, can testify. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. So they heard firing down at the Whitmers, and um, George BB was one of the 17 volunteers that decided to go down there, but this guy had been beat. He was one of the guys that was beat with an ox goad the night before, and he had scars of this whipping that he took to, with him to the grave. If I were this guy and I had just gotten whipped, I would, A, I would be pissed off enough to go down there and shoot some fools that had whipped me, but B, I would probably still be curled up in the fetal position crying from the pain, because I just, fuck that, getting whipped with an ox whip? No, 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 not okay. <laughs> That's not acceptable. Um... Anyway, let's see. Um, and yeah, uh, apparently this guy had scars from this beating until the day he died. Uh, amazing. Dibble dabble. Dude, you, you just bring this all together, man. You, you just really tell it how it is. I love Dibble Dabble's autobiography. It's amazing. When these 17 men arrived at the Whitmer settlement, the mob came against them and took some prisoners. Brother David Whitmer, D-Day David, brought us the news of this and said, Every man go and every man take a man. Ho! <laughs> so the Missourians had taken uh, the, some Mormons hostage and <laughs> David Whitmer was like, Two arms, motherfuckers! Go! let's take him out every man is take a man it doesn't matter if you die as long as you kill a man is at the same time whoa <laughs> this is crazy all right then the next section has a, like a little bit of a heading and it's called battle near the blue river november 4th 1833 all right so this is going to be the actual battle here <clears throat> We all responded and met the mob in battle in which I was wounded with an ounce ball and two buckshot, ah, all entering my body just at the right side of my navel. Oh, ow, <laughs> Dibble Dabble was shot. The mob were finally routed and the brethren chased them a mile away. Several others of the brethren were also shot and one named Andrew Barber was mortally wounded. Oh my God. 
God. So huge scuttle, huge battle. Um, Mormons were shot, um, a bunch of them. Apparently, Andrew Barber was fatally shot. And here, Dibble Dabble himself was shot three times in the side. Ah! <laughs> Oh, I'm just like holding my side thinking about how much that would hurt. God. After the battle was over, some of the brethren went to administer to him, but he objected to their praying that he might live and asked them if they could not see the angels present. He said the room was full of them and his greatest anxiety was for his friends to see what he saw until he breathed his last, which occurred at three o'clock in the morning. Whoa. Andrew Barber was hallucinating angels was like, hey, can't you guys see him? As he was bleeding out on the table. God, this is insane. A young lawyer named Hugh Brazel, who came into independence and wanted to make himself conspicuous, joined the mob and swore that he would wade in blood up to his chin. Oh, that's amazing. Okay, so, I mean, obviously, there was, with this scuttle happening, the, you know, there were some other Missourians that were shot. Now, if I'm not mistaken, a couple of them died, whereas only one Mormon died. But, you know, a lot of dudes were shot. That's the thing is, like, it was a scuttle. It was probably one huge, like, you know, standoff thing, and then one gun went off, and everybody else's guns went off, and everybody disbanded and ran away after that. That's that's my guess of how this happened, but I don't know. Uh, let's see. So this guy... Uh, Hugh Breezel joined the, the mob and he was like, I'm going to wade in blood up to my chin. He was looking out for Mormon blood here. And the next paragraph is, he was shot with two balls through his head and never spoke. <laughs> Whoa. That's amazing. There was another man whose name I fail to remember that lived on the big blue who made a similar boast. He was also taken at his word. His chin was shot off oh, or so badly fractured by a ball that he was forced to have it amputated. Oh, oh my God. But lived and recovered, though he was a horrible sight afterwards. Oh, <laughs> no way. The guy had his chin shot off and amputated. Uh uh, just thinking about the sight of a jawless guy from a gunshot wound. Oh, wow, that's crazy. After the battle, I took my gun and powder horn and started for home. When I got about halfway, I became faint and thirsty. Yeah, because you were shot. I wanted to stop at Brother Whitmer's to lay down. The house, however, was full of women and children, and they were so frightened that they objected to my entering as a mob had threatened that wherever they found a wounded man, they would kill men, women, and children. Oh, wow. So Dibble Dabble tried to, tried to like flee and get to Brother Whitmer's to rest and, you know, get some water because he was dying or, you know, bleeding out anyway. And the mob threatened that anybody that was housing a wounded Mormon, they would kill everybody inside. Whoa, this is heavy stuff. I continued on and arriving home, or rather at a house in the field that the mob had not torn down, which was near my own home. There I found my wife and two children and a number of other women who had assembled. I told them I was shot and wanted to lay down. They got me on the bed, but on thinking of what the mob had said, became frightened and assisted me upstairs. I told them, however, that I could not stay there. My pain was so great. They then got me downstairs again, and my wife went out to see if she could find any of the brethren. In searching for them, she got lost in the woods and was gone two hours, but learned that all the brethren had gone to the Colesville branch, three miles distant, taking all the wounded with them, save myself. Whoa! Whoa! Dibble Dabble's a badass! So he was like the one wounded guy that everybody was like, yeah, he's a... Uh, He's a goner. He's got three balls in him. He's he's Gonzo, and he <laughs> he got up and took his gun and his powder and shot. And he found a house where his wife and a few other people were. And he was like, "I gotta lay down because it hurts so much." And they uh, <laughs> he found out that everybody ran away. You know, his wife went looking for the other brethren, and she found out that they all ran away a few miles and took all the wounded except for Mister Dibble Dowl. That's God. This, this is so epic. The next morning I was taken farther off from the road that I might be concealed from the mob. I bled inwardly until my body was filled with blood and remained in this condition until the next day at 5 p.m. 
I was then examined by a surgeon who was in the Black Hawk War and who said that he had seen a great many men wounded, but never saw one wounded as I was that ever lived. He pronounced me a dead man. Oh, man. Dibble Dabble was a dead man. (sighs) David Whitmer, however, sent me word that I should live and not die, but I could see no possible chance to recover. After the surgeons had left me, Brother Newell Knight came to see me and sat down on the side of my head. He laid his right hand on my head, but never spoke. I felt the spirit resting upon me at the crown of my head before his hand touched me, and I knew immediately that I was going to be healed. It seemed to form like a ring under the skin and followed down my body. When the ring came to the wound, another ring formed around the first bullet hole, also the second and third. Then a ring formed on each shoulder and on each hip and followed down to the ends of my fingers and toes and left me. I immediately arose and discharged three quarts of blood or more with some pieces of my clothes that had been driven into my body by the bullets. I then dressed myself and went outdoors and saw the falling of the stars, which so encouraged the saints and frightened their enemies. It was one of the grandest sights I have ever beheld. From that time, not a drop of blood came from me, and I never afterwards felt the slightest pain or inconvenience from my wounds, except that I was somewhat weak from the loss of blood. That was crazy crazy amazing that oh wow oh my god that's that was just so amazing uh so apparently apparently dibble dabble was faith healed and from that time he didn't bleed anymore okay so uh, okay hang on hang on hang on so yeah david whitmer sent dibble dabble word that he wasn't gonna die and then newell knight came to see him and gave him a priesthood blessing, at which point he felt the spirit like transfer through his whole body or something, and then he squeezed out the three bullets, and he puked up a bunch of blood and some cloth that the bullets had like lodged in his body, took him with them, and then he dressed himself and went outside to watch the shooting stars. Wow. That was overwhelming. That was just amazing. I, I'm so uh, amazed by Dibble Dabble's recounting here. Uh, l- let's finish this out. Let's finish out the rest of his account here and see what else he has to tell us about this. The next day, I walked around the field, and the day following, I mounted a horse and rode eight miles and went three miles on foot. The night of the battle, many of the women and children ran into the woods. One sister, not being able to take all of her children with her, left her little boy, four years old, in a corn shock, where he remained until morning. Some went out on the burned prairie. The mob gathered and swore they would go and massacre them. When they got ready to go, the heavens were lit up with the falling of stars. This brought us to a perfect redemption at that time. The night of the battle, the mob took all my household furniture, and after my recovery, I crossed the river to Clay County, leaving behind me a drove of hogs, three cows, and all of my crop, which I never recovered. End quote. God, Dibble Dabble is such a fucking badass. Like, that's the only thing I can think of here. Like, out of all of that, out of the whole recounting, it's just abundantly clear that Dibble Dabble was uh, something special of a character in Mormon history. And his ability to recount the battles and recount everything in the way that he did is just so amazing and so... uh, empathy inducing it it makes you think of like what it was like to be there to witness these things happening to watch your your brethren fall to to bullets or watch them or hear them being flogged in the distance with ox goats i mean it's just wow it's just so overwhelming to read accounts like this hey it just you know first-hand accounts that are so detailed and graphic and that don't spare any of the the details like this any of the the gory realities that actually happened of this battle i mean there was just so much to digest there a lot of amazing information so uh, john goebbels whitmer you let us down man you really let us down in your recounting of the battle i mean 
none of those details that Dibble Dabble talked about were present, which is exactly why John Goebbels got the name that he did. I mean, he he was kind of responsible for propagandizing the history of the church and arguably was the first one to do it on a massive scale like this. I mean, even more so than Joseph. Today, this is a systematic problem, and I harp on it all the time, but I just find it so fascinating that the you know, whitewashing of Mormon history was happening this early on, and it still continues so rampantly today. Luckily for us, Mormon history is young and very accessible. If we find one account of history that is lacking in some way, like John Goebbels was, we can access a different source with a couple of Google searches, like Dibble Dabble, and we're no longer forced to rely on that one account that skips important details. With enough searching, we could probably even find a journal entry or a newspaper article or something from somebody that was part of the mob. I didn't go to that much work because I'm really satisfied with Dibble Dabble's account here, but I bet something like that exists out there somewhere. This is one reason that I enjoy researching Mormon history and recent history in general so much. There's always another account to look at where a completely different perspective could be offered and understood. I love looking at situations through the eyes of different people, and especially when they're first out no accounts like this and they were actually there. I mean, I would cover this in the listener mail segment, but it's also pertinent right now. I recently posted up a couple of pilot episodes about the new show for anybody that subscribes to Patreon, so go check those out and let me know what you think. And I'm currently reading The Late War Between the United States and Great Britain, which teaches a very America-centric version of the War of 1812. Now, in the process, I'm learning so much about a war that I know almost nothing about, and the recounting is extremely biased, which tends to color what I'm gleaning from the book. Well, I've come to some conclusions about the War of 1812 that seem to satisfy my shallow depth of knowledge, you know, about the war in general. But last week, I received an email from my good friend Hal, and attached was a 30-minute lecture on the war. I thought I understood some of the pressures that led up to the war, but this lecture enlightened me on quite a few details that I was unaware of, and it helped me to shift my understanding of the war. I should mention that it helped me with the pronunciation of some of the weirder names as well, like, you know, Rensselaer and so on and so forth. Uh, But don't get me wrong, there wasn't any information in the lecture that forced me to have, like, you know, a paradoxical shift of understanding about the war. But there were quite a few things that I wasn't aware of that I feel like I understand more readily now. Now, After listening to this lecture, I went onto YouTube and looked up a couple of other lectures and videos about the war. And it looks like historians differ on some details of the war, but, you know, much like every other historical topic. And I think that boils down to the sources those historians have been exposed to or have studied. It doesn't matter how much we think we know about a certain topic in history, because there will probably be a a different point of view that exists somewhere out there or a recounting of that topic that comes directly in conflict with our understanding of that topic. An example of this is made abundantly clear when we examine the different accounts of John Goebbels Whitmer and Philo Dibble Dabble. I mean, the Battle of November 3rd, 1833 between the Mormons and Missourians was only mentioned by John Goebbels in just two little lines, even though he had a first-hand experience of it. It was a first-hand account. Now, Dibble Dabble, on the other hand, was also a first-hand witness, but enlightened us with so many more details, including blood, gore, and violence for all to read and enjoy, including miraculous healing. He really captured what the atmosphere was like for the Mormons living in Missouri before they were driven out at gunpoint. I mean, can you even imagine how horrible it would be to be ripped out of your home and driven from your property and everything that you own, all because a mob of people didn't like your religion or your stance on owning people as property? I mean, how mind-boggling is that? Religious persecution in America today is really nothing like it used to be. I mean, today people cry persecution when somebody doesn't wish them Merry Christmas or when legislative action is taken to get the unconstitutional in God we trust off of money or removed from the Pledge of Allegiance. I would love to see how some of these wolf criers would hold up to some proper religious persecution like the Mormons in Missouri felt. Let's see how a milk toast softy Christian today is concerned about being wished Merry Christmas while they're being beaten with an ox goat and their house is being torn down with their wives and children screaming and running for their lives. Don't get me wrong. 
I'm not holding the Mormons blameless here because they clearly took aggressive steps that facilitated this persecution. But still, it all boils down to one human treating another like less than human or, you know, a mortal enemy human. And both sides were guilty of it in this situation. In looking back, I made light of Mormon persecution quite a few times. That hasn't been unfounded in most circumstances, but there are a few times in Mormon history where Mormons just got the living hell kicked out of them for seemingly no other reason than belief in their religion. Where I need to draw that distinction is when it comes to the masters versus the parishioners. The members of the church dealt with a lot of persecution, as did the masters and leaders of the church, but who was really responsible for such violent action? When we boil it all down, Joe and his incessant fuck-ups were at the heart of most of the persecution. He therefore bears responsibility for the deaths and beatings of every single one of these people. Whenever Joe was beat, I'm relatively certain that it was justified in some way, but countless other people were beat, whipped, tarred and feathered, and altogether shit on just because they followed a crazy cult. Just because these Mormons were part of the thems, the us's couldn't help but act like fucking apes towards them and violently remove them from their homes and beat them and treat them like just like subhuman. All that to say, let's just be nice. I mean, just be fucking nice to each other. I, I know that this is just an exercise in futility and it sounds so goddamn naive, but still, why can't people just treat each other like people? We're all united in Homo sapien, and these meaningless distinctions that we fight over only serve to drag everybody down. These stupid lines between rich and poor, black and white, Muslim and Christian, or something like Mormon and Protestant mean exactly dick at the end of the day. Now, I'm a proponent of humanism, but that word can mean so many things, and the term secular humanist is nearly synonymous with like devil-worshipping Satanist in some circles. So, in that respect, fuck humanism. How about equalism? That's what a lot of Mormons were pushing, and they had their asses handed to them for it. We are all equals, so let's treat each other like we're equal and push for equalism in our everyday life. There's simply no way of getting rid of all of the thems until we make them all us's. And that's it for the historical portion of this episode. Let's move on to a quick Patreon appreciation. Looks like we had one new Nemo juvenile delinquent. That's Ryan. Thank you very, very much, Ryan. I appreciate it. Now, I would do a listener mail segment, but holy shit, it's already at 2 hours and 45 minutes on my uh, recording here before editing, so that's already a long episode. I'm going to call that good. It's nearly 3 hours, so yeah, I think we're, we're going to call that a full episode. That's episode 28. Before finishing up today, I need to thank a few people. I'll start off by thanking Kyle for sending in his voice for the intro of this episode. If you'd like to have your voice featured in the intro in your blog or podcast or group plugged, you can find the script on the website. Simply email an mp3 of you saying those clips and it will be included in the show. Thanks to all the patrons who support the show. If you'd like to be as awesome as them, you can go to patreon.com slash nakedmormonism to sign up to make a per episode donation. If you can't afford a couple of bucks a month, you can always help out the show a bunch by going on to iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcast app of choice and leave a five-star review for the show. It only costs a couple of minutes instead of a couple bucks. Thank you to everybody that shares the show through Facebook, Twitter, and other social media. If you want to get in touch with me directly, email nakedmormonism at gmail.com and I'll try to answer your questions during the next listener mail segment. Check out the show notes and a lot more information about the show on nakedmormonismpodcast.com. Thanks to Demonista for working so hard on the Facebook page. It stays rich and fresh with content and lots of exciting conversation. Thanks to Jason Camo for his talented musical creation that is used in this show with his permission. For more of his amazing music, you can go to a alotstateofmind.com. From me, Bryce Blankenagle, I would like to especially thank you, the listener, for lending me your ear. I hope to talk at you next time here on the Naked Mormonism Podcast.